morning and welcome to your Saturday morning waker upper. I'm Alero Idu and this is Sunrise. I hope you've been up for a while. Just, you're just waking up now. <laughs> Good morning and welcome. <laughs> I'm Ayomakide. People have had a trying week. I mean, going to queue for petrol and all that. So they can have a lie in on Saturday. Come on. Babe, you know what they call body clock. Did you hear what she, he just called yes, me? Yes, babe. You're a babe. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> He's had some cocoa this morning. No, 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 no. I had and the cocoa cow. was laced. No, 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 please. I had cocoa. Please. And it was laced. Yes, with honey. Yes, thank you. Honey. Laced with something else. <laughs> <laughs> you know, these people that you are talking about, you know what they call body clock? You know now. Yeah, I know, I know what you mean. What's the thing? It's 4 o'clock, so people... <laughs> Many people in Lagos, especially, it's 4 a.m. because I have to get on the road by 4.30. Ah, Christ. Oh, life is hard, man. Anyway, that is that. I mean... Life is hard. And the first set of people you are taking care of, especially if you're a, a working mom, is the kids. Oh, please, don't, don't, don't remind me. I, I just thought, you know, my heart just went out to parents of that child. I mean, that toddler, that baby, oh. 19 months old, who was... How do you beat a baby to death? How? I have a 19-month-old grandbaby, and she's not even talking yet. And you beat, beat, beat it to death? What is happening to us? What's happening to our humanity? What has happened to Nigerians? This girl has got nothing to do with our humanity. It's just got something to do with some people who cannot control their frustrations. That, for me, is the summary of it all. But Ayo, in this same country, mm. the neighbors, you know, people around would look after your child for you without even knowing you. How many years ago was this? Well, when I was growing up. Okay. Now you're grown. <laughs> <laughs> when I was growing up. Sad to say, but... It is the reality. The frustration back in time isn't anything near what we have today. True. And so many people um, cannot control the, their frustrations. You know, remember, I don't know if I ever told you this. We had a reason to talk to a clinical psychologist um, once on the daily version of this program. And one of the questions that I asked the man, I think it was uh, 2019, like, uh, what's the average age when someone can get anxiety or you know, any of these things? Mm. No, depression. Said they have diagnosed kids as little as 10 years old with depression. Mm. Question I ask myself is, um, what fees is he paying? <laughs> <laughs> what, what, is, responsibility what responsibility does he have that he is depressed? Depressed at age 10. So, so when he has to pay house rent and school fees and... I don't know, man, allowance. whether that would be full-blown arrow case. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know, you know, but... No, so seriously, seriously. If, if a child of 10 can have depression, you can imagine what someone as old as whoever it is that, you know, Beats committed a child to death. this crime mm. uh, would have gone through or would be going through at a time. Yes. Some people cannot control criticism. They can't manage criticism. They can't manage negative words. Mm. And so the responsibility, the onus is now on parents. Look, if you're going to put your child in anyone's care, first of all, be sure of their, their mental psychological case, their, their state. mental state. Yes. I, I yes. had reason to, you know, my, my child came home years ago, years ago. I, she's tw over 20 now. Years ago when she was maybe in the nursery or primary school, and came home with some marks, and the mom saw it. I didn't pay attention until the morning. And mom said, ah, look at this. Beat my child with, you know, all these marks. Wheels. So I went to the school to, you know, talk to the teacher. My wife said she wanted to go. I said, yes, if you go, it's going to be civil war. <laughs> so <laughs> hold your horse. I went to, I said, let me even reason with the child, with mm. the teacher. Mm. What happened? Mm. You don't beat a child like that. That's what I was going to do. It was my daughter that was reminding me years after, maybe about uh, four, five years ago, that when I got to the school, I was trying to reason with the teacher. The guy was just prancing around. He said, he said, he said, he didn't know when his dad slapped the guy the first time. Oh. And when the, the, the guy wanted to 
we thought uh, said her dad that's my daughter was saying that her dad, her dad you <laughs> slapped the guy a second time oh. and the guy now came calmed down oh. i'm only trying to reason with you you are a teacher you are being paid to take care of kids now not to kill them. Not to kill, not to maim them, not to yeah. put marks on them and all of that. Yeah. So you don't do this all the time. You don't do this at all in any way, manner, shape or form. I'm just trying to reason with you so that if you're having any frustration, you don't take it out on kids. That's the message that was the, the, the intention. Of the father. Of the father. Yes. To <laughs> communicate to this, to this teacher. After that time, any time this girl misbehaved, the guy will come out of the class and say, Come on. Everybody come and see you. <laughs> Smarter they will come now. They will come and be beating. <laughs> come and be slapping me. So <laughs> parents have a responsibility mm. to pay attention to some things. It is the reason some parents have CCTV cameras at home. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that you can be able to monitor these things. Thank God for wireless, you know, C yes. cams yes. all over the place yes. now. So it is a responsibility we have. You're going to make money to take care of these kids. Money is not everything. And anyway, this child is in a play group. This child is there to play. That's and you have killed this child because it was playing with water. You you, you it is there to play. You it's called a play the group. The responsibility you have is actually to mark the play. Yes, now. Is it not you this? play well or you not play well. <laughs> so it, it is, it is I mean, sad. It's, 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 it's sad. sad. It is sad. painful. I don't know if there's another case in Lagos or somewhere mm. that was reported yesterday. This one didn't die, but she was beaten so bad. And we saw the wheels on the back of the child. And there are so many... So many the, this one was two years old. How parents, do you beat a two-year-old and leave marks on their body, for God's sake? Parents... They're at the age where you're still cuddling and kissing them. We just need to pay attention to our <clears throat> kids. Oh. Oh, yes. Um, have you noticed the deafening silence regarding the 96 financiers of uh, terrorism? Um, is there... What was the call to action after this press conference? Okay. Uh, let me try to situate it. I'm not a member of the Federal Executive Council. <laughs> I'm not... I should hope not. <laughs> ...a member of the presidency. Mm. I don't work with the Federal Ministry of Information, Information and Culture. I'm not any of his essays or PAs mm. or SSAs okay, or PPAs. Okay, we, we get whatever. that. Okay. Get to the point. However, uh -huh. remember when this Abakari case also started? Mm -hmm. And then after some time, we heard nothing. He was suspended, and then we heard nothing. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, NDLA comes out and blows the lead off the top of the case. And okay. then we are where we are today. Okay. Maybe this is the same thing that is happening. Okay. Now, don't forget that we have numbers. 96, this one, mm. 123, that one, who are terrorism financiers and sympathizers. Okay. We don't have names. We just have numbers. numbers. Okay, so, fine. We uh, await the 96 names in time. Yes, and 123 companies. Sympathizers. And sympathizers mm. and all mm. that. So Kiari Gate, our super cop. Our super cop is a drug baron. Well, that's a name that's been mentioned already. Uh -uh. How is that possible? Okay, he's not. He's innocent until proven guilty. Yeah. Even though we saw that NDLEA video and everything. Mm. Or to use With professor... Money's exchanging hands. Uh, one, uh, one professor, I've forgotten uh, the, the gentleman's name. Or guilty unto proven innocent. <laughs> <laughs> that seems to be what it is in Nigeria. That's, that's, that's what he is. <laughs> you know, that, that matter is... For me, I look at it... I, I have tried to see it more from a systemic perspective than from an individual perspective. From what... Let's look at the system that produces super cops and makes them vulnerable for me that is it's the lesson that we need to learn what happened how many of them how many of such tremendous super cops do we have who are vulnerable to corruption but i we say on this program we talk about the police and anytime we talk about the police we always say until our police officers are well looked after we will not arrive where we want to get to with our, uh, m m well, we, we can't have all of them incorruptible, 
Well, we will have most of them incorruptible because they're pleased with the remuneration that they're getting. Especially, but as long as they have to buy their own uniform with money from their pockets, mm -hmm. buy their shoes with money, from and go to the same market everyone goes to, and buy four tomatoes at five hundred naira. In the main, in the meantime, the we all are in the same economy, and mm -hmm. um, if you look at the forecast today. Uh, we understand that economy tops growth forecast. That's the first item we're going to be discussing. Yes, my, my, my issue is always, so does it mean that food is going to be cheaper in the market? Oh, well, we'll find out <laughs> more of that. Okay. <laughs> yes, after that, we're going to be looking at estate development, fraud in the system. Ah, ah. Mm. Oh, dear. Mm. 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 Estate development, not housing development, but of course, we'll, we'll get more details as the time. So it's talking about development. Business development, service providers, and SMEs. From there, we shall turn our focus on International Mother Tongue Day. So, I mean, like, I should be going to school and be taught in Shakiri, for instance. Yes, and um, wait, is it, is, is Mother Tongue Day, Mother not vernacular day. Mm -mm. Mother Tongue Day. Find out the difference between Mother Tongue and Vernacular. And that is... <laughs> mother Tongue, the, the tongue of your mother. Uh, so what's Vernacular? The, the tongue of your father. <laughs> <laughs> Artist of the week will cap the program today, so please stick with us. We'll be right back. <laughs> All right, that's the first conversation we're having this morning. A recent report by the National Bureau of Statistics uh, says the nation's GDP has grown, or rather, yeah, it grew by 3.98%. That's approximately 4% in the last quarter of last year, sustaining a, pro a positive um, trajectory, a trajectory. So it's going higher. Um, so how do you juxtapose that with inflation figures and all other figures that we always get? Let's take a look at this and the impact on the economy and Nigerians. First of our uh, guest this morning is joining us virtually, Johnson Chuku is MD, Kari Asset Management Limited. Thank you so much for joining us today, Mr. Chuku. Thank you, Ayo and Alera, for having me. Good morning. Good morning. So, um, is there, for you, is there anything to cheer? Let's begin from there. Yes, absolutely. I mean, if you are coming from a, a recessionary period, as we had in 2020, and your economy has begun to grow at a rate above population growth rate, it's something to share because of your over time, if our economy con consistently grows at that rate, we will gradually begin to reduce the number of people in the, and even at the provider, we will begin, gradually begin to see improvement in our standard of living. And basically, when you mentioned inflation, remember that what happens that when inflation, inflation begins to moderate if the level of productivity improves. So it's something to cheer. Um, cast your mind back to 20, um, 2020, the economy contracted by about 1.98%, and for, sorry, 1.92%. And now we're talking of a growth of about 3.4% uh, year on year. So that, that's, uh, that's an improvement, material improvement. Of course, we shouldn't fail to take cognizance of the fact that that growth was partly influenced by the fact that the previous year, the economy it, it, it depressed or it went into a recession. So we are going from a lower base. But all the same, a growth of 3.4%, which is the highest we've had since um, uh, 2015, right? actually 20, yeah, 2015, uh, it's, it's something to, to it's a, a form of relief to all of us. Okay, um, Mr. Chuku. Um, what exactly would you attribute this uh, marginal growth to? Yes, I did mention earlier that we have what you call base effect. The economy depressed up, uh, it went down in 2020 by 1.92%. So we are growing at from a lower base. In effect, what you would, to put it in a very graphical format, it's like you are growing, if you say two, if you, if you grow from two to three, that's a 50% growth. But if you grow from four to five, it's still one, uh, one unit that have, you have grown, but four to five will give you only a 25% a growth. But if you grow from two to three, it is considered that you have grown by 50%. So what happened is that the economy went into the size of the economy contracted in 2020. So when we grew uh, back to where we were, and you measure that from where, where, where we had gotten to, where we had depressed to, it gives an impression of a much higher growth. 
But if you look at the sectors that actually contributed to that growth rate, the strongest growth we saw was in the uh, financial services sector that grew by about 10 percent. That's what they call it the highest growth we had that last year. And then you had sectors like the telecommunication sector that grew by about 5.6 percent. The trade sector also grew strong by about 8 percent. So those sectors drove the growth we saw in, in 2020. Um, of course, there are laggards like the, um, the uh, what do you call it, the oil and gas sector that contracted. You know, um, when we hear these figures from time to time, Mr. Chukudi, the, the question that comes to my mind is, how does this affect the man on the street? Um, but before we get to that one, how do states contribute? I, I'm still not satisfied, by the way, about your explanation concerning um, inflation figure vis-a-vis -vis economy, economic uh, GDP figures, because at the end of the day, how will the economy grow when it doesn't have a direct impact on people's lives? That's the question a number of people would, would uh, be asking you, and that's that why they'll be wondering. <laughs> All economists want to do is just to give you the figures. So help us understand better the growth of GDP vis-a-vis -vis inflation figures, which is also, of course, not as friendly as one would expect. Okay, let me start from a simple definition of a layman definition of uh, inflation. Inflation is basically when too much money is pushing few goods. What that means is that the economy is not, not, not producing as much goods as is growing the money in circulation. Uh, and what happens is that when the economy begins to grow more goods and services, produce more goods and services, and the volume of money in circulation does not change, what have people will now the, 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 the market power will move from uh, the buyer, from the seller to the buyer. So the seller will be in a weaker position in the sense that they are now asking you to pay a small amount of money to get this good because they are competing for your share of wallet. Because your money has not increased, but then the quantity of goods available have increased. So what happens is that those who are producing those goods and services will be asking you to pay a reduced amount of money so that you can buy from them. And that's basically why we say that, look, when the level of productivity in the economy improves and there's no commensurate in increase in the level of money in circulation, then inflation will begin to moderate. And basically, if you are buying a, a product, for instance, for 20 naira, and because there's so much supply of that product in the market, and the, cost, the sellers are selling it to buy 18 naira, the inflation will, where you're actually going to have what you call deflation, uh, or the rate at which they are able to increase price will reduce, which is basically what we call reduced rate of inflation. So that's, that's, the, that's the connection between level of productivity and inflation rates. And one of the challenges we had in inflation is because food production actually declined over, over a period of time because of this increase in, in the major food bed of the country. And because of that decline, the quantity of food that is produced reduced, and Nigerians have to beg to pay more to buy those uh, uh, available food. Remember the inflation of optic we had came about when we shut down the border. And then the number of the volume of rice and other commodities coming from the land border reduced. But Nigeria still has to buy to feed themselves. They are still consuming the same quantity of goods. So they were ready to scrabble and pay more for those available goods. That's basically what the connection. That's why I said, look, if the economy goes into a high level of productivity and produces more goods and services without a commensurate increase in the amount of money in circulation, you are going to see a reduction in the inflation rate. Uh, how does this growth affect the life of the common man on the street who's already grappling with rising prices and stagnant incomes? Well, what you, we are going to see is that there's always what they call lag effects in economic terms. Lag effects mean that it takes some time before economic policies or development of the economy begin to cascade down the entire population. Uh, if you cast your mind back to the Obasanjo uh, era, uh, there was a time when the argument was that we're having uh, growth that people could not feel. But over time, people began to enjoy the benefit of that growth. Level of unemployment declined, uh, purchasing power improved, exchange rate improved. And then Nigerians were coming back to this country from diaspora to want to come back to the country. The country became a, a, a priority destination for investors. So it takes some time to mature. For instance, I had mentioned earlier that the Inflation, the growth rate of 3.4% is higher than the, pop, the population growth of about 3%. What that means is that if we continue to add the 
the volume of the value of goods and services we produce in the country is increasing every year by 3.4 percent. And then the quantity of the number of people we're adding is increasing by 3 percent. We are adding an additional 0.4 percent above the population, above what we are consuming. That will build up our servants. That will build up resources that will make it easier for people to, to have access to resources. And the, the thing you have to recognize that when the public economy is growing, it simply means there is more production, there's more productivity. It simply means that companies will are producing goods and their goods are being consumed or demanded for. So they will, are going to go to the labor market and ask for more uh, employment or more labor, mm -hmm. which will lead to a reduction in level of unemployment. But these things have does not have one spontaneously. It's going to take uh -huh. some time okay. because when you produce, you have to sell the goods and you have to ask for additional labor. When you realize, oh, really, I can't stay you for that. Because initially we say, okay, let's increase our shift with existing staff. But when you exhaust your capacity to increase your shift, you may not say, okay, let's do the additional plant. Let's expand our plant. So that will mm. be the way you import access for additional equipment, access for additional labor, access for other input materials. That's the way it works. So there's always that lag effect. But the most important thing is that your economy should grow at a rate above your population growth rate. And that's only when, over time, you're going to begin to see the impact on the population. The, the question that uh, many people will still want to ask is, generally people are not patient because, as Halero mentioned, <laughs> the buying power seems to be struggling with the mm -hmm. things to buy and all of that. But um, we, when we talk about the growth of the economy, of Nigeria's economy, we talk about it at the federal, national level, holistic, right? What role do states have to play in all of these? And how can the states contribute to this, help speed up this process that you're talking about so that people can begin to feel the impacts quicker? Don't forget, the federal government does not have a state. It's the states that make up the Federal Republic of Nigeria. And it is in the states that the people live. So is there a role for state governments or you know, state government agencies and all of that in this whole process you're talking about? Yes, absolutely. You know, we talk of uh, GDP growth. We're actually aggregating the value of goods and services produced in the country. And like you say, the production and consumption centers are the states. Uh, the federal government, which is only based in Abuja, really, is just a small piece of the activity or great uh, account of the, a small piece of the level of consumption and level of production. So production actually takes place at the, at the, at the peripheries or the centers or the uh, states. The key thing that the states have to do is that in the first place, they need to uh, reduce, work towards reducing the cost of their business in their states. And that will come in the form of building supporting infrastructure that uh, will encourage productive activity at lower cost. Two, the states have the more efficient in their tax administration so that you do not overburden people. You are also able to extract revenue from the people who are working in your state and you deploy these resources effectively and efficiently to improve the economic uh, environment. The third factor or the fourth factor is the policy environment. The policy environment will come in the form of are there incentives that are created by state to encourage private sector investments? And two, uh, is the state working towards creating the opportunities or the resources or the critical capital investment that are required by private sector to situate in those things? The reality is that a few states in the country have become the centers of private sector investment because of the environment that the state government has created. Lagos State, for instance, account for about 40% of our consumption. And that means and more than a significant portion of our production activities, productive activities in the country. Because people see the environment as reasonably security uh, free, uh, I mean, it's, it's security free, not that it's, there's any, any part of the country that's completely um, free from it, high level insecurity, but Lagos seems to be like an oasis uh, away from other states. Again, you have a government consistently over time have works. And that's what private sector people are looking for. Um, where insecurity worsens, people, private sector will move away from that place. Mm. So the key thing is that for us to grow the economy, the states are the critical contributors to what happens. Because it's at the state level that consumption takes place, it's at the state level that production also takes place. Sustainability of this thing is, is one thing that we need to look at. You've talked about, you've given the example of Lagos and everyone in Nigeria seems to be looking in that direction. But you know, uh, 
the, the question that one would want to ask is, what role does leadership have to play in all of this conversation that we are having? You cited the former president, Olusha Gombasunjo's era, and how things went at the time. I don't know if people can say the same thing as of this moment. And what we are having today is not something that started yesterday. It is also historical. So in, on the one hand, what role does leadership have to play in this? And if it is a leadership problem that we have, how about the system? How about institutionalizing the process so that irrespective of who comes in government, there is a role to play and they are playing it as it ought to be played? Okay, I would say that leadership, it starts against with leadership. Leadership develop, determine the culture and sometimes we think culture comes from, from heaven. It is consistent practice that is called culture. Leadership define the culture, leadership define the core values of the society and leadership also prioritizes what is critical and important to the society including do we want to focus on the economy what kind of economy do we want to have how do we ensure that we have the right labor to fit, in, fit into the kind of economy we have to have leadership define all those things so it starts it starts and ends with uh, the leadership um one of the life examples i always like to uh, present as a proof of concept is that it's leadership that really defines the uh, telecommunication sector that today accounts the largest, third largest contributor to the economy. Because uh, with all due respect to, uh, without really being patronizing, our passengers government came up with a, a telecommunication uh, law uh, that made it possible for private sector investors to invest in that sector without the government trying to build it. Because some of the things that we've had in the past or uh, subsequently that the government wants to be at the commanding height of businesses and they don't want to create just environment and allow the private sector to bring capital to those areas. So leadership is everything. Mm. Um, I wouldn't talk about uh, what uh, current leadership has done, but I think the key thing that the, the report card is there. Um, this is the highest growth we've seen since the beginning of the current government. If you cast your mind back, in 2014, this economy grew by about 6.2%. 6 in 2015, when the government came in, it grew by 2.79%. By 2016, the economy contracted by 1.58%, only to grow by 0.82% in 2017, and then 1.91% in 2018. And, um, and then in 2020, 20, um, 2019, it grew by 2.27%, only to go down again at 1.92% in 2020. And then, luckily for us, it's not just luck. Of course, we know, like I said, I've talked about the factor that contributed to that. We grew at 3.4%. So this is the best we've seen in a couple of years. Mm. And it's all hitting is that the focus of the government has been on economic management. Are we really uh, if coming up with the appropriate policies that will incentivize the investment in this economy, incentivize productive activity in the economy, and are we consistently pursuing those policies? Mm. These are the questions uh, that the government must always agitate their mind. Well, you haven't really <laughs> answered that question, but we're going to get to it. <laughs> Dr. Olusha Go Omishakin has since joined us. He's with us in the studio, Chief Economist and Director of Research and Development, Nigeria Economic Summit Group. Thank you so much for joining us Thank today. You for having me. First of all, your, 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 your take on this growth disclosed by the MBS about Nigeria's GDP by 3.98% in the last quarter. This smile on your face is suspect. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just, I just, I'm just trying to reflect on the need to always discuss uh, growth every time we have the numbers and uh, people try to just oppose the numbers. But isn't, isn't With it the about reality. the numbers? Reality. So exactly. I know it, we always come back to that. But do we feel it? But are we seeing it? But again, we, whatever discussion that we, we need to have, first of all, let's set it within the context of the data. Then we talk about why do we have that uh, difference between what the data says and what the life, what people are feeling. So it's, it's a commendable growth, you know, um, whether you view it from the fact that uh, last year, 2020, I mean, 2020 growth was uh, in a decline and then 2021 uh, seems to be very high. Yes, you can see yes, as the base effect, whatever explanation, but growth is growth. Uh, it's commendable because when you are advocating for a better economy, 
uh, for a stability for stability in the macro environment for investments to come in. Everything starts from how you are growing. And there is no way you can have a sustained growth, fast growth, an economy that is competitive when you don't grow at all. So let's see what happens. There are see a lot of he used to discuss around growth and how growth is linked to inclusive growth and the business environment and our external balance in, 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 in general. Let me, growth is growth allow, me, is allow me to... Um, to make this sound a little simplistic. Okay. So let's say, is it as simple? Is this growth thing you're talking about and people not feeling it as simple as someone having value, but the value not rep rep being represented in the person's bank account? For instance, okay, this person is valued <laughs> at this, but he doesn't have money in his bank account. Is it that simple? No, I think it's, a, let me follow the example <laughs> of growth. I think it's a matter of definition. Okay. Uh, for instance, you can have a uh, value in terms of, somebody can say, okay, so have plus of land, mm -hmm. and the person can still be trekking everywhere, hungry, mm -hmm. uh, because it's all about definition. If mm -hmm. the plot of land is not what is used in the economy, is not what is convertible to Naira and Kobo for Gosh. you to buy, you, you have to say, I have the plot of land, and then you make sure that that discussion is separate from, I, I don't have money. GDP is not a true measure of welfare. And I think that's what people should know. And this is <clears throat> a long, uh, well debated issue. So when people see GDP growth rate, they quickly want to think about people on the street. Mm. But that's not what MBS is telling us. It doesn't that's, really it affect doesn't, them, does that, it? That's not the essence of the data. Okay. What's right? the essence of the data? The, the essence of the data from a gross domestic pr I mean, product measures the value of uh what you are producing domestically right and when you say producing mm. you are not referring to the people on the street as it were okay. get me right okay and again when the when the survey is conducted in just like in any uh survey analysis you don't go house to house and 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 interview about 200 million people to say what have you produced? Okay, let's record it, let's do this. So there are issues around sampling. And when you got that, that one out, what you are discussing again is not a matter of how does this growth affect you? Who is earning what? For instance, if you are 10, if you are three here, you produce a good, I mean, good words, 10 million. I'm producing 500,000. You are producing 1,000. And then the, the interview was conducted for for her, myself. And then they say, oh, we are growing by so, so, so. It's her growth and my growth that seems to be, that seems to matter. But so for you, you, you so feel- So you've excluded me. Not that you are not, you know, no, 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 you are, you are not excluded. Don't, don't, don't get me. I'm only trying to let you know that. No, no, I you know, You don't but use I'm just that saying... to just say you are better off, right? Because to say, am I better off? The question would then come to how has the growth distributed? How has the income being distributed. Do, do you get my point? Not what is the income. In, what is the income question is what do you, what is our worth in this family? Another question is what is my share? And then for you to ask what is your share, you then have to have have I contributed to this? So if the minority are the one contributing to the growth, then the majority will not feel it. But is okay. this part of the issues that you said need to be, my, my apologies, Alero. Mm. Is it part of the issues that you said need, still need to be discussed concerning this matter? Yes, yes. Uh, and I first established the fact that this is a good uh, starting point. Mm. Uh, nobody should take that one from the government. Mm. But there are issues that mm. goes beyond GDP growth rates. Okay, doctor. Um, in saying that this was a good thing, you also went ahead to mention investment. Yep. Now, how conducive is our country at the moment to attract any kind of investment, whether overseas, from overseas, or even within Nigeria? Is it the right time for Nigerians to begin to invest and look at starting up new businesses? Uh, well, it depends on the type of investment we are talking about. Well, whatever type of investment, we all know that the environment is not conducive. And, uh, and there are, because investment, uh, business environment, it's not just a function of GDP growth rate. In fact, as a matter of fact, if you had had a, a better conducive environment, you would have recorded higher growth rate. Uh, so um, 
you have uh, foreign direct investment cut off, like we, we are not there. Uh, you have a foreign portfolio investment that we used to, uh, you know, be proud of. And in fact, then we used to say, oh, this doesn't really matter in the long run because people just bring in the money, they take the money out. But that, again, is not, is not there now. So we are doing pretty bad when it comes to so, the investment environment and attracting investors. So and there are so told, many factors that, all that told, will Doc, explain that. Yeah. It's better for us to have them invest and be carrying out the money than for them not to come at all? No, no, what I'm saying is one is better than the other. Mm -hmm. You come, you, you invest, infrastructure, build this, build that. Mm -hmm. The other one is you come, you invest in the short-term portfolio. Uh, in, the, in the market, you put in your money there, you hand the profits, you, you pull out. Mm. Uh, it happens everywhere. But what I'm now saying is even for both, we are not doing good. Okay. Let, let me ask you this, Dr. Omishaki. I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, Mr. Chuku wants to contribute as well, but let me ask you this. Uh, you've talked about the need to make the investment climate better. Uh, Mr. Chuku, spoke, speaking earlier, also said there is a role for the states um, to play in all of this. Part of what he said was that, look, the states need to uh, help make the inv investment environment, the business environment, a little more conducive by reducing certain costs which has been the, the function that the Presidential Enabling Business Environment Council has been trying to play over the past five years plus. In your opinion, in order to help these figures reflect quicker in people's lives, what are the things that states need to do? What are the roles that the states themselves need to play so that we can fast track this? Because as far as the people are, is, are concerned, if the growth is only in numbers and not in their pockets, it's no growth. Yeah, I, I, I agree with him 100%. Uh, the, the emphasis has always been on the federal government or the national, at the national level. Yes, and, and the reasons are obvious. When you talk about major macro uh, indicators that are needed to attract investors. You don't talk about the rule of states there. The FX stability, the inflation stability, and so many other factors. Yes, we all know we are not that that's that's in itself, you know, could be a problem. But at the at the state level, I think the, the subnationals over time, uh, both the economic analysts and the and even the political you know environment are not really looking at are not really seeing themselves as playing huge role. You will hear state governors lamenting that the government needs to do more to attract the <laughs> investors. You know, the government. <laughs> <laughs> you doing? Hardly would you. I think that one, uh, except one state, uh, and I was involved with their history of doing business uh, analysis and the rest, a state who came up to say, OK, let's do his of doing, let's replicate what the federal government is doing. Let's look at our tax condition, let's look at our infrastructure, let's look at so many things. But you hardly hear that among other states. Uh, we, all, we all know how it runs. So the role of states is very important. In fact, if the states are doing better, the question of people are not, are people feeling it will not be there. Mm -hmm. Because at that level, especially the informal market, the informal economy resides not in Abuja, but in, in the states. Yeah. So if they come up with a clear economic strategy as to how do we I mean, attract investors, how do we make registering businesses or making things easy within our own local economy. I think people will not be so, uh, will not be angry with NPS data. Is that, is that in any way in, uh, inferring that the uh, intervention of the federal government, uh, where the partnership between the federal government and the states is not as uh, strong or efficient as it ought to be. Yeah, for some, for some times, yes. But I think now we could, we are seeing some improvement. At the NESG, we are not just speaking to the national uh, government or at the national level. We are also partnering with the state governors at the NGA, Nigerian Governors Forum, and uh, many they've done a lot of you know advocacies and initiatives <clears throat> as to how to first of all replicate what the federal government is doing or key in into national plans and so many other economic and financial or investment initiatives yes i think it's getting a little bit better i mean better but they need to uh, there is a need for a serious improvement at the state level do you see a buying of the people in the states 
to the initiatives of the, st of the state governments? You mean people by people, you mean the businesses, small businesses and all of that? Of course. Of course. In fact, most of the, most of the initiatives you are seeing are being, I mean, are being brought up by uh, most businesses. Businesses are not, I don't think that businessmen or business, because again, we have to look at it properly. These are informal markets. Most of them are this, uh, I'm not really talking about Ogun, Lagos, and Kano, all these major states, mm. in other states, Oshun. It's all about the people, people that are selling basic things. So okay. if, if they see transparency, openness in the way you go about your tax administrations and the rest, they will, they will support the government. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chuku, um, how much of this growth can be attributed to the private sector? I mean, arising from the analysis he just gave us. Um, if you look at uh, the growth we saw uh, and you look at it by the sector that drove that growth. I had mentioned the financial services sector. That is large, 100% in the private sector hand. I had mentioned trade. That's 100% in the private sector hand. And I've also mentioned telecommunications sector. This was the fastest growing sector of the economy. In terms of uh, uh, GDP contribution, the other is you have agriculture, which I found about 6% of the GDP, followed by trade about 15.6%, followed, um, followed by ICT, then followed by manufacturing, and then you have the construction industry. This sector, or the real estate industry, this, all these sectors are largely in the hands of the private sector. But for the uh, agricultural sector, where the government is doing a lot to encourage uh, agricultural activities, I would say that the other sectors are largely driven by the policy environment and the huge market that Nigeria has. Because, because of our size, we have naturally have a huge market, and that is what is driving uh, the trade sector driving telecommunication sector driving the construction industry so i, I think on the balance one would say that over 95 percent of the growth we saw in the economy was private sector driven beyond that in terms of uh, uh, in terms of policies i one would ordinarily say that the policy of the government has been at the fiscal side of it has actually been uh, weak uh, if there is any policy coming from the government that is encouraging productive activities coming from the monetary uh, authorities, where, for instance, the manufacturing sector is enjoying sub-market interest rates. Uh, but the Nigerian economy today, in terms of productive activity, in terms of consumption, I, is largely driven by the private sector. Mm. Um, 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 Doc, Doc uh, Festus Akimboyewa says that um, uh, the increase in international price of oil may have contributed to the recent economic growth. How true is that? Uh, not, not really, uh, at least according to the data that we have. <laughs> um, you know, so that didn't play any part at all? No, 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 no. We can't say it didn't play any part at all. Okay. There are always um, direct, indirect uh, impacts and so many things. But when you look at data, you, you, the question is, when the oil price uh, declined then, we attributed the uh, failure when we enter into recession to oh, it's global oil prices. Now the oil prices have been going up, mm -hmm. and, up uh, and up. Uh, we are not. so the question is, how do you appropriate that advantage? It's not just automatic that the oil price is going up, so you get more. It depends on what, how much you are producing. So if the oil price of uh, Gary is going up in the market, and you are a Gary producer. You can't just sit and be happy and say, oh, well, no. You have to quickly make sure that you increase your production to appropriate the benefit. We are not doing that. We have serious challenges with oil production. In fact, we are doing beyond the OPEC plus uh, Amikota. We are doing worse than we were doing when the oil price was low. And so I know the government is also tackling that. So it, and then the, the sector is still in, uh, I mean, contracted. So much of the growth that we've seen now and we've been seeing for some quarters are driven by the non whole sector. That doesn't mean that mm. indirect impacts are not there. For instance, uh, your FX, government gets most of the revenue, mean, the, the foreign earning from the same sector. So you can't really say your whole sector, our sector is dead. But when it comes to basic economic activities, the non whole sector, just like what you just mentioned now, are the main drivers of the Nigerian economy for now. But if we appropriate that, we get the environment clear. You understand the PI is passed, 
And then uh, people were of the opinion that this would be a game changer. And then suddenly you have the government saying, oh, let's postpone the implementation, especially on the side of the subsidy removal mm. uh, implementation. So these are the signals that are still affecting the sector till now. Okay. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, I want to ask you both a question. Um, uh, Mr. Chuku, you started the other time by talking about some policies that we have employed that has helped one way or another. And uh, when we're talking about no in our sector, <laughs> the natural one that will first of all come to many people's minds will be Agriculture, Agric. right? Um, and we've been talking about agriculture for God, how many years now? <laughs> I, I remember there are policies of government around agriculture date back pre-independence. I, I recall the first of them being the farm settlement scheme or something like that. And mm -hmm. virtually every government in Nigeria has initiated one policy or another in trying to mainstream agriculture. Do you see us as a nation focusing on one major you know, revenue earner beyond oil? Just like maybe just like Dubai did when they decided to create an economy of, for themselves that they didn't have before. Or, or, or Singapore or Rwanda. Do you see a situation or a time in our country where we decide we focus our energies, everything that we need to do, our education, our health, our, even our petroleum, along the line of, say, this agriculture that is supposed to be our cash cow, so to speak, pre-independence and even into independence before oil became what it before the oil boom that was it do you see a time or a need for us to focus on this particular one and channel all energies along that direction and what i would say is that uh, the focus on agricultural sector has been like correctly pointed and has been the trend in the history of this country if you remember we had operation feed the nation we had a green revolution we have had all sorts of uh, uh, catch words and policies focused primarily on agriculture. You would actually say that the policies of the government of, the, of Nigeria in the past have largely been uh, skewed in favor of agriculture. But unfortunately, I must say this, agriculture will at best be a source of enjoy, uh, uh, what you call national food security. Agriculture is never and can never be a source for a country to leapfrog into a developed economy. Agriculture is at the base of human engagement, which is called the extractive industry. It is important in the sense that for you to have food security, for you to have, the, have your country secured, you must be able to produce what you eat, and you must not depend on other countries for what you consume in terms of food. But it cannot be a basis for the country to become a developed country. And even with the policies we've had, the agricultural sector has actually been in decline. The highest growth we saw in the agricultural sector was under when uh, Akumi Adesina was the Minister of uh, Agriculture. At the, last, at the end of last year, the agricultural sector grew up by only 2.12%, which is one of the lowest it has had grown in the past seven years. So a couple of things are happening. One, previous policies on agriculture have been on a uh, handout of fertilizers and some food implements without addressing the core of the agricultural sector. And those core should be, we must have an agricultural sector in the private sector driven. We must encourage uh, commercial agricultural activities. And we must also support agriculture with the basic infrastructure. Do we have irrigation? Okay. Do we have access to evacuate the food that is produced? All right. Do we reduce, do we have silos to make sure that we don't have wastages at the farm gates? Okay. These are critical. Yeah, well, well, well it's, a, it's a big discussion, but let, let me take uh, uh, Dr. Mishakin's comments as well, since we seem to be running out of time. Do you agree with him? Yeah, I agree with him. Uh, but it was the same agriculture that the First Republic used to literally... Run this country. Run the country. Yeah. Raised a lot of money from the, the granite pyramids, the cocoa industries, and all of those things. Uh, it's easy gave, to... Gave scholarships. It's, yeah, yeah, it's easy loads to Loads of scholarships and bursaries. Those, those, well, but again, uh, that was then, uh, globally. Now you want, to, you want to be among the League of Nations. You can... Which, so let's ask the question, which of the developed countries or emerging economy are just championing a Greek? Uh, that doesn't mean you are not going to grow because, again, globally, when you look at the, the future of poverty among nations, 
uh, many economists have concluded that agri, at the lowest level, the way it's being practiced, agri, agri sector is a, is a poverty enhancing sector. <laughs> at, the, at the way we are practicing it. Because the question should go beyond who, where we have many people in agri. We have the largest, agri is the largest employer of labor. Yeah, but but when you compare the productivity, it's poor. So, it's Doc, poor. What is so, stopping us from moving ahead and doing what other nations are doing in the area of our Greek? Why are we still at this subsistence level? <laughs> and that's why we are discussing all this. And we hope <laughs> that the government will. I know it's not something you just wake up and do, but it, it takes a lot of seriousness. It takes a lot of a, I mean, consistency. It's not a matter of oh, a government come does a little and then under government of focus which has government. been the problem yes the which policy. has been the problem yes. Yes. now i remember the vice president still talking about the the this uh, agriculture bid the vice president's office came up with the data sometime when we were, there was in early 2020 or thereabouts when we we're talking about this national livestock transformation plan mm. and they talked about the fact that the livestock value chain alone in nigeria the livestock value chain alone is 30 trillion naira, or is it naira or dollars? I'm not even sure. Enough to take care of now, our entire that, budget. The, the entire value chain of only livestock, and I'm not, of course, you know, I'm not talking about several others, you know, uh, other bits of this thing. So if we look at the entire agricultural Don't value you. chain, we definitely are talking about something. Uh, the, the leather bags that uh, women use, they come from hides and skins. Yeah. So, I mean, just... But, but, but that doesn't translate to what you eventually produce, what you get to the market. Yeah. So we produce a lot. We harvest a lot. Uh, storage, zero. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Transportation, zero. And so you have a time when uh, a, a man mango will be everywhere, cheap. Mm -hmm. Tomatoes. And then the next month is 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 gone. Mm. That that is the issue. Okay. So it, that is a technology. That's how tech changes things. Okay. It's not we, just we, about what you are able to grow. We have but to. How close. do you get it to the market? We have to close, gentlemen. Yeah. So let me ask you this pointedly: a yes or no question. You, you know, <laughs> yes or no. You want to, do you <laughs> see? Do you see a potential in agriculture for Nigeria? Yes, I do. Good, Mr. Chuku. Do you see a potential in agriculture for Nigeria as an economist? Yes, but... I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. Go ahead. We need to improve the agricultural value chain, but it will not make us a developed economy. Mm. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for uh, this conversation this morning. Uh, Mr. Johnson Chuku is MD, Kari Asset Management Limited, as well as uh, Dr. Olushengo Mishaki, Chief Economist and Director of Research and Development, Nigeria Economic Summit Group. Thank you so much for your time You're and focus this morning. Thank you. So, sunrise continues after now with uh, something a little related. Stay with us. Thank you for staying with us. A nice looking building in that uh, slide. Yes, yes. Would you like to buy one of them? Um, it depends on the cost and when I'm going to get it. Yeah. They tell you you'll get it probably in one year, in 18 months, but you get it maybe nine years later. Well, do I wait to get my belt when I want to go to, go to a shop to buy it? Okay, people. So sometimes when you're looking for a... a com an, uh, accommodation in Lagos. It can be a Herculean task and sometimes you are so unlucky you fall into the hands of fraudulent estate developers whom you pay and tell you they're going to deliver to you within 18 months and deliver to you five years later or you fall into the hands five of an years. estate agent who collects money from you and collects money from 10 others. Oh, I know about that. Ooh. Well, that sector. I'm glad to see that Lagos State, uh, according to the SA, to the governor who came, she was our guest about two, three weeks ago, yeah. was here saying that they were actually making efforts to clean up the sector. Yeah. But people are still falling victim to all these developers and all these estate agents. 
Well, we have uh, called some people to give us some clarity in this area, and we have uh, Shiyu Lufemi, a property developer. Good morning. Good morning. And we also have uh, Rotola Williams, who is a property consultant and director of Gracie and Gracie Limited. Good morning. Good morning, Rotola. Good morning. Good to see you. <sighs> well, um, I'm going to be speaking from experience because um, I bought a property from a developer <laughs> who delivered property to me two years later than it was expected. And uh, my major issue, number one, was at the point of collecting the keys to a shell, um, bills were given to me which had not been discussed earlier. Bills for, uh, okay, VAT, I think VAT was being paid at the time. Uh, there was a rumor that VAT had been canceled on property, is that correct? Well, uh, you shouldn't had it to, to rent. No, to buy. To buy, no, well, not that I'm aware. Well, you, you forgive me, Alero, because I can see that, I can see the legal papers in your on your lap right now. <laughs> but before we get into that, <laughs> let's quickly have a, a conversation with um, our correspondent in Osho State. Um, they, we understand that uh, major contestants in today's primary uh, have been in a war of words months before today's exercise. The incumbent governor, uh, is seeking another four-year term to preside over the affairs of the state there has been no love lost between him and his predecessor, the Minister of Internal Affairs, Ralph Aregbashala, who says Governor Yutola has not followed the master plan of the state. So those are live visuals from Washington State Primary, uh, early visuals, the ones that, that, that came a little um, earlier. Also in the race for the APC's governorship ticket in Washington State is former Secretary to the State Government, Moshud Adeoti and former Deputy Speaker, House of Representatives, Honorable Lasson Yusuf. We will definitely bring you um, live updates as they occur. Our correspondent will be bringing us some of those things. Maybe some of the issues that have been raised in Washington State have to do with housing. I won't be able to know, will I? Well. <clears throat> <laughs> yes, so VAT on purchase is no longer payable. They shouldn't charge you for that, ideally. When was this abrogated? Uh, I'm not sure I have the timeline in mind, but they shouldn't charge you for that. Uh, and also, if they're going to charge you anything, hmm. they should tell you up front, this is what we're going to charge you. When before. were they, going, when were they okay. supposed to have told you? Up front, well, before you buy. Before, before hmm. you buy. Okay. So if, if I say this before you buy, it cannot be outside that. Okay. Because what it means is I can double the price of my property <laughs> by charging you some other charge. So, um... This bill here is for legal and survey fee. Not discussed at the point where I was paying for the property. This is at the point where I'm collecting, I want to collect my keys. Legal and survey. This is for improvement fee. I wonder what you're going to improve in a shell that you're selling to me. Wait, wait, wait. wait just I'm going that. to finish it myself. Oh, wait. You're not going to get a finished house. No, no, no. It's a shell. What does that mean in simple English? Please, what is a shell? Well, uh, some people develop a property, they finish the exterior, uh -huh. and then they leave the inside, uh, either just a block board or just plastered, without any door, without POP, without tile. It's a, for, it's, it's a form of uh, product that you, people offer. It allows you the flexibility of finishing to your taste. Okay. So instead of removing the finished product and having to do it again. And Why don't I just build my house from, the, from scratch myself? Ah, well. You don't you want may. to deal with approvals, you don't want to deal with artisan, you, don't want to, you just want to get the house and then complete it to your test. It's, it's popular in the market, actually. It is. Because some it people is. prefer it. Let me do my tiling, let me do my POP. I have my, specific. And a lot, of, a lot of women don't want to buy cement and buy iron rods. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so what then is the job of uh, an estate developer who can just come to my land and build for me? You know, you also have something called economies of, set, of scale. So if you are building one house, Right, you know how much that's going to cost. But if somebody is buying, bringing in cement for a hundred houses or twenty houses, they're going to be able to bring down the average cost of the building. And like okay. you rightly said, um, it's not just women who don't want to be the ones supervising 
the building. You need to, it's a house, so there has to be some level of technical expertise. So that's where the developer comes in. He brings in his technical um, expertise. I've worked with um, Shay before. I can vouch for him. I was, I, there's some people I can speak for. Him I can speak for. <laughs> um, he, he has a, a standard of, a, a quality standard that he meets. I look at um, the people I'm working with because oh. in my business, reputation is everything. You understand? So before I work with a developer, I tend to do what they call KYC, know your client, yeah. okay? Yeah. So, I've, like I said, I've worked with uh, Shea before. I can, I, can speak, I can speak for him. Okay. Not, you, this is Nigeria. We are in a hostile business environment. So there are good developers, there are new inexperienced developers, and then there are people who, the other developers. your favorite people who like to cut corners. I Lucky not, Gardens. I will not mention hmm. any names, right? <sighs> so um, there are, you know, different types of developers in the market, and each one of them offers a different product. Okay. Depending on your pocket, your situation, your taste. Yeah. You might want to do a shell. Mm. Um, somebody like me, I don't like to be bothered. You know, I might just tell him, Finished. just do the whole thing for me. The most I might say is, okay, I want my, my fridge from Germany or my, my gas oven finish from Italy. The finish but the house. Do, Whatever yes, finish it is the that house I need to me. do, I can redo. No, they have various estates. Some of them are just exclusively shell and but some are exclusively finished. So I, you I, choose which I, one I, you want to buy Just into. a moment, uh, uh, Mr. I, I, I wanted to... I want you to, you know, help educate many people. Because just as she has said, I mean, there are those who will go into these um, partnerships, let me call it that, uh, for the sake of the conversation. They go into these partnerships with high expectations, only to get at the end, or rather towards the end of the race, you, you're having all these other, you know, figures thrown the in. The goalpost has that. been shifted. Yeah, so the question that I would want to ask you is, um, first of all, how proper is it to sign some papers with a grand, finale, grand total at the end, only for me at the point of uh, you know, collecting what you promised to give me, to be having, okay, well, uh, you need to add this before I give you the keys. How, how proper is that? Is this something that is popular in the market as well? Well, there's two questions there. How proper is it? We both know it's highly improper. Is it popular in the market? Yes. Some people do it. But I think the slow starting... Down, slow down, ma'am. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I don't want to name any names no, 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 because no, no. obviously I, I have experience. No, no, no. I don't want I you to name any names. I have experience, so... I don't want yes. to name any names. <laughs> yes. Is it popular in the market? Yes, yes. it is. Okay. Your situation it is, is not unique. It is improper, it's not. It is improper, but it is popular. But it is popular. Okay, speak to that then. Then we'll talk okay. about the regulatory end. I, I, think, I think part of it is... Um, if you are going to buy a house, a house is a huge investment. Whether most people can do it for their, you know, as a pension or mm -hmm. you're, you're starting a family, it's a huge investment. So what I've noticed in my time here in Lagos is you don't, people don't start entering those investments with the right people. You need to get a professional realtor and a lawyer to work with you. Those people have they, they will have experience in the market so they'll be able to tell you at the point that you're doing your contract with your developer that okay this is what i want this is i don't want this it's up to you the buyer to now decide on what you want if you start every transaction with a lawyer and every land transaction with either a professional realtor or a lawyer then you, you're starting on solid ground so your lawyer will ask those questions that you might not necessarily ask you understand, if Alera had come to, uh, well, I don't know any of the, the law firms, they would have said to her, yeah. okay, have you asked them uh, these, questions. these questions? When did they say they're going to um, get your building ready? What happens if they don't get the building ready on time? Um, what is your development levy or improvement mm. levy? You know, because once you built your house... You in, put your fingers like that. <laughs> yes, because some people call it development levy, some people call it improvement levy. You once you, the, once it, you built your house in the estate, uh -huh. right, your contract, your original contract will say you can't bring a generator on there, right? Yeah. So you have to connect yeah, to, the, the, grid. to yeah. the grid. Yeah. And it's at that point that they'll tell you you need to pay 3.5, 5.5 to connect to the grid. And you, what can you do? You have to. 
Yeah, you're but this, this is not proper, is it? You should be no, told she... all this at the point you're paying for the property. Let me ask so you. So you know yeah. to put away this money when you go to collect the keys, you present them with the money. The question so that they don't I tell you anything. The question that I want to ask Mr. Olufemi on that is, I mean, you also agree it's improper, right? I agree it's improper. You also <clears throat> ag agree that it is popular. Yeah, it is very popular. Okay, very popular. Very popular. So then it suggests that government More is work aware for you guys. and is looking the other way. No, uh, I, I don't think we should call it that way. Uh, le let me say this too. Um, so, first of all, when you're going into a contract, just like you said, the first thing is to ask what are all the fees that I need to pay. Most people never ask. And, um, and you know, so the most developer is and taking advantage of that. Well, to an extent, yes. Then two, also, uh, I'm, not, I'm not trying to defend that practice. But let me put it this way. For example, when we sell, we say, okay, this house is this one. This is all the fee you are going to pay. Uh -huh. So you know it from the beginning. It's stated in the contract. Thank you. But what you see at the end of the day is a lot of people now start arguing, this is too much, that is too much, this is too much. But it's better to fight it at the beginning. But we've lost customers because of that. Okay. You understand? So, you know, okay. that, that, that is, so a lot of people just you say, you know, customers when because you they look at it, this other fee, fees. Yeah, for example, we, we have a project we're doing. We say, look, you pay 47, your other fees, including legal, this, this, this and that, is 3.5 million. This okay. is what it covers. Okay. You understand? You fight people would, because of that 3.5, so they're not doing they're not doing. So, oh. you know, so if you're not, if you're not clear, you know, it, it takes some, you know, it's, it's not sometimes you just want to like, okay. I would charge this one, there are some, and they'll put it there, other development fees that would come. If you check your contract, you will see that they've indicated that other fees will be at the time of handing over. They just didn't tell you the amount. Yeah, yeah and so, when that but, time comes, they can put any amount that comes to their heads. So now, which brings it back to what, at the beginning, if anybody is buying, you need to ask what are other fees, and you need to say, sign off that I'm not paying any other thing. In fact, People ask my um, service charge within the estate. What is the range? You should ask. Uh -huh. uh, how do you plan to review it? People ask us that question. Uh -huh. yes. So those are things that can be clear. But I just don't want us to. There, there are two things you raised when you first of all asked me the question: the issue of delivery on time, uh -huh. and the issue of all these other fees. We've, you know, so this is what we're talking about now. Yes. So Which, I, I, and you have agreed that. The buyer should be told at the point of, of purchase, purchase. Nobody should be ambushed. There are additional fees which you will pay when you come to collect e your exactly. key. Exactly. And the it will range between this and, and this. this. Exactly. Give them an idea. Exactly. In the because they don't, they're not all politicians who can just whip 10 million from their handbags and give to you. Someone is going to have to ask you, you know, to corroborate that if that is true, that a politician can just... But well, if that is true... I, I'm not, I've not dealt no, with she's any... No, she's the one. If that is the case, Mr. Lufemi, okay. isn't there some regulatory or a supervisory responsibility or some agency that's supposed to ensure protection of the people? From Consumer such, protection... Yes, from such... Council. I don't even... Is the word Shylock practice? Uh, things are getting better. Uh, quite a, if you follow the news in recent time, there are, there are laws that are coming into place. And then I think uh, uh, the, the, the current administration, I'm not a politician, so I'm not speaking for them. Uh, there, there are quite a lot of initiatives that are going on. It, it will take a while. But before now, uh, the regulatory environment was very lax. Uh, which is why you see a lot of there, there are no standardized uh, sharp practice. There, there are no standardized. This is what should be done. And then also um, because we don't have database of transactions. Mm. If you if you're buying, for example, uh, there are listing platforms. There are you can see everything. If you're buying outside this climb, mm. you can compare cost. You can know what the fees will be. You mm. can you know. So we don't have that, and it's going to take a while. Um, now, now, look, um, I have a friend who paid for a property in 2013 okay. before she retired and it was supposed to be her retirement home. Mm. She still has not got delivery of the property to this day. Mm. So maybe I should be asking the lawyer, uh, can she seek redress and what should she do? Of course she can. 2013, of, of, it's of, nine of, years now. Yes, of course. Well, that's an inordinately long time. Um, yes, she can seek redress, and she probably ought to have done something on it um, by now. 
Uh, she hasn't. It's well, a she woman. needs to. It, well, you know that. That's why I say when you when you do land transactions because of the nature of land transactions it's very important to get lawyers involved from the from the day get you decide your yes from mm. the get-go if you have a lawyer on it the person will be the one to be harassing the oh, well, i say harassing but they, they'll be on it they'll be on the word. developer <laughs> it's a proper you know, word uh, when is the delivery going to come on i've i've seen some like some of the um luxury units in Ikoi, some of the high-end high, high -end right. luxury units. Mm. Some of those developers, what they'll do, if they do a late delivery, they might say, okay, we've done a late delivery, so we're going to give you a compromise on maybe your service charge or whatever it is. They'll have some sort of compromise on there. But the most important thing is, if you're buying land, any land, you must get a lawyer involved. The developers themselves, they run into issues. You know, you... you you enter a contract with somebody, you believe that you are able to start, and then when you want to start, a whole bunch of thugs come along and tell you that it's their land. What do you do? Mm. You know, mm. those are some of the factors that can delay delivery of a project. Well, and, and if you're a developer, you've, you know, maybe you've hired a, a, a bulldozer, you know, you've paid your however much it is, 5 million, 10 million a day, and each day you can't work, adds money to the, adds money to the project. So mm. there are a whole range of... Um, is, there, is there a role for government in that? I, I'm asking that advisedly because at the end of the day, uh, we have it said, we say from time to time that all land in the state belongs to the government, mm -hmm. right? Now, um, you have that kind of a situation and then some, what do you call, landowners? I'm trying not to use the Yoruba word I'm for like that. You know, land grabber. They, they come land and they grabbers. say, mm. land okay, grabbers. It's, it's their property. You have to do this before you do this. You have mm, to do course. that before you do that. So isn't there some, for lack of a better word, complicity of government in this? Um, I wouldn't say so. Um, I mean, each, each situation is different. You can have a situation where you're a landowner, you've registered your land, you've maybe you've not fenced your land and then you now want to do something with it when you get there there are vagabonds trespassers you have to start resorting to the law to get them off like i said it's a, it's a hostile business environment but the profits to be made are very high so people still go into these um, transactions you understand now as per government <clears throat> intervention there's only so much government can do yes you can i think I think Lagos State has a land, uh, they have a section that deals with, um, specifically that deals with land grabbers. They set up something that specifically deals with land grabbers. So you can go to them. But I think, like I said, from day one, anything to do with land, you just make sure you have a lawyer with you and then you take it from there. At that point, things just become a lot easier because they'll advise you, they'll be able to tell you, you can get a restraining order here, you can get the police to come in here. There's so many things that, they, they offer, but unfortunately, um, lawyers are expensive. People don't want to pay them. Exactly. Um, <laughs> did you but say... They're protecting a very... Did you say... Did you say them? We. We? We? Us. Us. Lawyers. Now, the issue of you guys building this estate and insisting on managing the estates, is that standard practice? No, it's not. It depends on what you want to do. You don't have to manage the estate. Good. You don't have to manage it. So the homeowners are actually free to just say, we don't want you to manage for us. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Yeah, that is a, uh, a possibility, yeah. And people should explore that. For example, for us, I really don't want to manage anything. Okay. You know, so it's not... Com but because it provides residual revenue for developer, so there's an incentive to want to manage so that's, that's Even if you're doing it badly and you've been kicked out of many of your estates? <laughs> <laughs> I, ideally, uh, this is what the standard practice should be. If you finish and deliver the estate, mm -hmm. let's say you manage for a period of time before the uh, owners uh, can Actually come together in. effectively. Yeah. And then the owners should have a say in who manages it, essentially. And you don't have to be the person managing it. Uh, even for some of those who insist, it's also changing. Because then I said, no, you can't manage it. We are going to bring a professional facility person to manage. So you can still now have an arrangement that gives us a bit of revenue. Of course, it might not be as what you would have gotten. 
I'm, I'm sure that if uh, the developer is not doing it very well, very few will insist they must manage it. Except, you know, that's why it's very important. The beginning is the most important part. I'm still going to talk about the issue of delay because using practical experience that we've had. Okay. Now, the beginning is the most important part of any transaction when it comes to real estate. Mm -hmm. It must be clear. Everything must be documented. You cannot, every point must be documented. You know, so and you know, unfortunately, you, you can. Uh, there must be transparency on every side. Ah. You must be willing to, you know. Transparency. See, see, let let, uh, let me use my uh, my example. Ah. Now we, we ah. started. I'm going to divide a bit into issue of delay. We have a project that is some months over over the period we're supposed to deliver right now. Uh, I, I'm sure you might be aware. We had moved to that particular site about a year ago, and then suddenly. All hell was let loose. In fact, we were, we had done the foundation for 23 duplex unit. We we're going to the next. Uh, till today, we've not been able to access that land. And we're, we've gone to court twice. Omonile. Omonile. Uh, <laughs> Baba Onile. Everything. everything <laughs> just went Baba Onile. <laughs> now, but we were lucky. Uh, well, some clients have asked for refund. Uh, I think it started march april last year till today we can access the place so when you give them a refund is it with a premium taking into cognizance interest rates and all that honestly uh, we've not paid any premium right now uh but because <laughs> you have a refund of hundreds of millions okay now suppose this friend of mine who paid in 2013 wants her money back as a lawyer what should happen it depends what's in her contract uh -oh. it depends what she signed with them oh okay that's why I said it's very important to get a lawyer in from the very beginning. Okay. There, should be, there should be a clause in there of what would happen if the developer breaches the contract. Is it too late now? Yeah. Oh, dear. <laughs> the lawyers uh, oh dear. I'm oh interested dear. in this issue that you raised, mm. uh, Mr. Rufemi, because, um, you know, those people that you're talking about now, you are clearly concerned about them as well, not being... The, the fact that you are not able to deliver to them. Some of them probably already have their lives planned out exactly. around that. So mm -hmm. exactly. uh, what then are the options for you? Because I asked the, about, you know, the function of government, you know, the role government have to play in all of these. Because she talked about a hostile environment for business, and that's the kind of thing that you're experiencing now. So that's why I go back to what role is there for government to play? I'm almost certain that you did everything you can to finish all the paperwork. Across, all the, across all the channels. Um, first of all, I think also government is overwhelmed. The volume, yeah, it is. The volume of, of cases, Complaints. you will not believe it. Every day, uh, somebody is fighting somebody over a plot of land. Over, so it's a crazy mix, to use that word. Uh, but what I also think is, I think that the agency that will regulate this has to have a bit of independence too. Because political pressure mm. affects land transaction. Mm -hmm. Oh. So, uh, you've had instances where the legal owner are not able to, uh, to use their site. It happens. So, uh, I, I think that has to come to play. And then also, um, a bit more transparency on the side of the government too. Uh, everybody should be able to see any transaction at any point of time. This is part of the problem. Because I don't know how many people have tried to get uh, to do documentation for your land. You cannot predict where you're going to end from when it's going to start. So it's, it, it, so, you know, so you just have to make do. So there's a problem in the system. Yeah, there is a challenge in the system. Okay, so in closing now, because we have just about two minutes, um, Madam, in solving this problem holistically and long term, what would be your recommendation in terms of standardizing? You've talked about the role that individuals have to play, that is ensure that you get a lawyer in so you don't... From uh, day one. From, from day the very one. beginning, so you don't end your transaction before it starts. So, but in terms of regulating and ensuring that we create a more conducive um, business or investment environment in, in building and construction industry, what are the recommendations you'd make to government? Well, I think it would be a good idea if the government had a, a meeting with their stakeholders, come together, and then from there they'd be able to know what kind of framework they want to do. Because at the end of the day, land is a huge investment. It helps, it brings in jobs, it helps your local economy, it 
it basically dictates even your inflation level. So it's actually a very important area of the economy that I think uh, the government, not just Lagos State, should be concentrating Absolutely. on. Do you see the laws we have sufficient enough to take care of all the issues? Absolutely not. There needs to be a lot more done. A lot more done. So the laws, the regulatory framework is not even strong enough? No, I don't think so. Okay. You're a practitioner. Do you, what, what would be your own suggestions? First of all, I think data, database. Um, an average person on the street should be able to go check and verify any particular location anytime. That is shrouded in secrecy. You need to know somebody, you need to be able to really... You, you, have you ever done a land search before? You know, very few people honestly would understand how to do it in the first place. Even if you, as a lawyer, you want to go there. There's like, something the state is trying to do about that. They have a map they can say, okay, you can go to a social website, you can see all the ones that are available and all the ones that are not. All the ones that are available, who owns it at the moment, what are the specific coordinates, what are the uh, encumbrances on that. An average person should be able to check without necessarily having to go through a whole hog of challenge. And even then, it's what is registered. It's what is registered that you will see. With the state government. Yes, you will not see that there's a court case on the land. You will not see that um, somebody has sold to somebody has sold to somebody. It's only after, it's only if I choose to register my interest that you will see that I'm the owner. I can sell to you and not register my, or you can sell to me rather, and I choose not to register my interest to the state government? Yes. If, if you build oh, wow. it, 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 it. <laughs> I think at this point I give up. <laughs> Can I say this? Please, quickly. I don't think you should. Uh, that sector can virtually change the economy. Mm. So we only need to do what we need to do. Yeah, but it'll change the economy if only you people are transparent. People want to deal with you, but if you keep giving them at every point, you're stopping them and giving them bill, they, they move one step again, you give them another bill, they're going to be discouraged. I would love and to have this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> if you also give them fraudulent meters, I live alone, and my bill over the last one year was 750,000 naira for power. You have you approached? And it's not 24 hours. Can I, can I, 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 and have wow. you approached the, the management of the facility? We have meetings with them. Oh, the you, cost of diesel has gone up. Do you up. have a strong um, uh, uh, landowners association? Not yet. That's, 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 that's what you All of a sudden, the guests have become the ones asking the questions. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yes, we've run completely out of time. So I just want to thank you for coming, uh, Rotola Williams. Director Grachi and Grachi, who's a property consultant, property lawyer, as well as Dr. Sheyi Olufemi, who is all a property developer. Thank you very Thank much you for so coming much. to enlighten us today, even though we may need to bring you guys back, because this thing is by no way, this topic is by no way, by no means exhausted. There's still plenty we need to learn so about much. this so before much. we get our fingers burnt. Definitely. Thank you very much Thank for coming. So much. Thank you. So, in just a moment, We'll be discussing another matter. Join us. We started by the program today by talking about the economy. Now let's talk business. How about that? Like the idea of business. Okay, well, she's still busy seeding over that one. Well, the availability and access to business development service providers uh, for public and private sector is essential for SMEs to learn and acquire new skills regarding marketing, operations, management, resourcing, technology, and innovation, and the whole works. To give us, to give us some more perspectives on how to remain steadfast in providing the necessary business guidance for MSMEs to help grow the Nigerian economy. We have with us in our studio here in uh, Lagos, Wahid Alagujo, who is former acting managing director and CEO Bank of Industry, as well as chairman National Steering Committee on Business Development Service Providers, BDSPs. Thanks for joining us this morning. Thank you for having me. Also, we have uh, Peter Bamkole, who is Director, Enterprise Development Center, Pan-Atlantic University. He joins us from Abuja Studio. Thanks for joining us. As well as Monday Ewans, who is Director, Enterprise Development and Promotion uh, of uh, Smedan. 
uh, he joins us from Abuja Studio. Thanks for joining us. Mr. Bamkole is on Zoom. Thank you, uh, gentlemen, for being a part of this conversation this morning. Let me begin with you, uh, Mr. Lagunju. Give us some perspectives about what we're talking about here, um, because business development service providers, what does it mean, really? Also known as um, small and medium enterprises consultants. Okay. These are highly skilled uh, professionals who support entrepreneurs to actualize um, their vision, um, potential and current entrepreneurs to actualize their, their vision. Um, current entrepreneurs are generally referred to as uh, brown fields. Those are those who are already in their businesses. Um, they might not be doing well. They might not be able to realize their full potentials because of some challenge, because of some lapses in their businesses. You did touch on some of them. Um, marketing challenges, it could be technological challenges, it could be problems with their business model, it could be having to do with their keeping their financials, which is a major challenge that most um, SMEs are faced with. So the BDSP support them to strength, they strengthen them to ensure that their businesses are very well managed. That's as regards brownfields. Now you now talk about potential entrepreneurs, those who have a vision, those who have something in mind that they want to do, but they don't know how to go about it. So BDSPs support them in producing what we call bankable business proposals. Mm. It doesn't mean that every business entrepreneur must go to a bank for funds, but bankable means uh, just the way of ensuring that the business is viable and sustainable. Because you can raise your funds from family and friends, you can raise your funds through equity investors, and you could raise your funds through debt. In other words, usually funds coming from debt or equity. So you have to be ensure that the business is well structured and uh, you have a good business model in mind. Then there's another leg of potential entrepreneurs who do not even have an idea of what they want to do. Mm. So BDSPs generally play advocacy role as well by sensitizing people, potential entrepreneurs, to the business opportunities in the environment. We've had a lot about narration, about how endowed Nigeria is in many respects. But most people do not know how to convert effectively and efficiently areas in which you have comparative advantage into competitive advantage. Which has been a, the which is the bane of many small businesses, you would agree. Correct. Uh, there are those who say that, you know, the average lifespan of a business in Nigeria is five years. If you can survive five years, then you have a potential to survive. This BDSP thing you're talking about, is it a new philosophy or is it something that's been on ground that people are, have not been aware of? It's not a new philosophy. It's been on, right, in business management all over the world. Mm. But um, in Nigeria, started to really, the Small and Medium Enterprise Development Agency of Nigeria, SMEDAN, is mandated with the responsibility of accrediting BDSPs in the country. Then financial institutions too have realized the need to have BDSPs. For example, the Bank of Industry, um, around 2014, 2015 or so, um, decided to enlist about 120 BDSPs across the country. Because the major challenge facing financial institutions is that they, norm they are normally faced with poorly packaged applications mm. from SMEs. According to studies conducted by KPMG and uh, EDC in 2019, the rejection rate is almost about 90%. Mm. Because no, you would no. have seen a lot of that when you were in of, the of, bank of industry. Of, of, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm speaking from experience and position of knowledge. Mm. So I was part of the team, actually, I was EDSMU at that time when the uh, VDSP schemes were introduced at the bank of industry. And it was one of the tools we used in growing the credits to SMEs at the Bank of Industry from an annual average of 1.8 billion prior to my appointment as EDSME in 2014 to 28 billion by 2018 when I left the bank in December. Right? That gave us an annual average of 7 billion. Mm. So you can look at the, so the BDSPs mm. Mm. contributed amongst other um, tools that were deployed to mm. ensuring them. Because what, when you have good BDSP to package your proposals for you, it reduces the turnaround time at the bank. Because usually most of the requirements that the banks need to take investment decisions would have been uh, provided for the BDSP. Exactly. Yes. And yes. then it also enhances the approval uh, pro pro prospects as mm. well when mm. you have a good BDSP. Okay. So sometimes um, in 2020 or so, 
uh, the Honorable Minister of Industry and in, uh, Minister of Honorable Minister of State for Minister of Industry and Investment Meeting inaugurated the National Steering Committee for BDSPs. And I was uh, appointed as chairman of that steering committee, which includes the Enterprise Development uh, Center of the Pan Atlantic University, um, the Cardinal Business School, um, and many other uh, establishments. So we are responsible with accrediting BDSPs. Because in the country, too, there are also a lot of fake and quack BDSPs. Mm -hmm. Well, let's let Collect money begin. from SMEs, yeah. poorly prepared for criminal results, and uh, those proposals don't meet the requirements of financial well, institutions. Most, most so we are streamlining all this. Yeah, most certainly. We can't let you go without ensuring that you get this done for us. <laughs> but before uh, we, we let, let's continue, uh, bring in um, Mr. Evans, uh, who Evans, Mr. Evans, who is uh, executive, who is director, enterprise development and promotion at Smidan. Now, exactly what, in your opinion, are the SMEs contending with, especially with this BDSBs not being uh, on the board until now? Can you hear me, Mr. Owens? Hello, good morning, everybody. Yes, good morning. I'm happy to be part of this program this morning. Yeah. And of course, uh, business development service providers are key to development of the uh, MSME subsector in Nigeria because they need direction, quality direction, technical direction. And then these BGSPs are expected to have that technical skill to support them. They are supposed to have uh, the abreast of uh, every diagnostic tool to support them. They are also supposed to be aware of the environment, know exactly what is happening in the MSME ecosystem. And of course, before now, <coughs> the agency has recognized that it is proper and fine to support small businesses. And the BDPs are there to support the small businesses. And of course, we're also worried about the quality of support. Because these days, we have a, a lot of people calling themselves uh, BDSPs. They are not qualified. They are not professionally qualified. They don't have the technical ability to support BDSPs, to support MSMEs. In this regard, the MSMEs that are supposed to be supported are shortchanged. They are not giving uh, value for their money. Uh, they are giving substandard uh, services. And of course, what that means is that once BDS, uh, MSMEs are not having quality service, it will also affect the operations and also ultimately affect their contribution to the GDP uh, in terms of job creation, work creation, and poverty alleviation. So we, uh, the, in, the intent of Smedan is to make sure that we have a quality BDSP ecosystem in Nigeria to be able to support small businesses to the best of their ability, to the best of their professional ability, so that MSMEs will have that quality, will have that uh, ability to support the growth of uh, the economy in terms of uh, jobs and so on and so forth. So the major challenge uh, the MSMEs have uh, with uh, BDSP is the uh, issue of uh, making sure that the people that support them have the quality, have the talent, have the professional attitude to be able to support them the way they are supposed to be supported in the economy. Smedan support small and medium scale industries. Mr. Iwans, did you hear me? Yes, I'm hearing you now. Yes, I said in what way or ways does Smedan support these small industries, small and medium? Okay. Th thank you so much. If I hear you well, you're asking in what ways Medan supports the, the MSMEs in Nigeria. Correct. Of course, um, the, the agency was established by uh, uh, an act of the National Assembly called Smida Act 2003, and it has been amended so far. And then the major objective of that act is to, for Smedan to support the development, to facilitate the development of uh, MSMEs in Nigeria, making sure that they're in a position to support the economy with job creation, wealth creation, and poverty alleviation. And of course, the act that established Smedan has uh, several powers and several functions um, enshrined in the, in the act. But from our day-to-day -day activities, we are printing about five platforms. The first platform is uh, called, that will support the small businesses with uh, credible information. 
information that relates to how to start a, a small business, how to run a small business, how they can assess uh, resources needed to start or scale their businesses, resources like finance, market, equipment, technology, and so on and so forth. The second platform is uh, what we call delivery of a business development service, which includes issues related to um, capacity building, um, counseling, mentoring, and advisory services. Of course, for Smedan, our key area is entrepreneurship uh, training and uh, development, which essentially people call having the, the power to uh, have business management skills. And of course, the top platform is that we encourage clustering and the networking. Clustering in the sense that when uh, small businesses come together, they're able to have access to common facilities, have access to knowledge, have access to skills, even markets and so on and so forth. And then networking is also key because with networking, you can have access to uh, finance, additional knowledge, additional skills, and so on and so forth. Of course, the fourth platform is what we call um, policy and public advocacy on behalf of small businesses. And of course, under this platform, we have developed the first ever national policy on MSMEs. Of course, it was developed in 2007 in partnership with uh, UNDP and other stakeholders. Of course, the policy was all renewed last year, uh, uh, approved by the Federal Executive Council, uh, 17th March 2020. And of course, this policy is to support all those challenges, all those challenges uh, affecting small businesses, issues related to lack of access to finance, uh, legal regulatory issues, skills, uh, markets, technology, and so on and so forth. So this document is there to give ways and, um, and uh, skills to make sure that these challenges are, are ameliorated for small businesses to grow okay. the way they're <laughs> supposed to grow. And okay. then finally, the agency supports, uh, facilitates access to some of these critical resources that uh, small businesses need to, to grow. Issues okay. like access to finance, markets, technology, workspace, and so on and so forth. Well, and I, of course, I'm tempted, uh, Mr. Elwans, to, my apologies, I, I'm tempted to take you in a whole lot of trajectories because the, the, the question that I believe Alero is asking is, look, how do you even, well, part of the question would be, how do we uh, situate Smidan uh, as a development agency for micro, small, and medium businesses in the light of all of the myriad of uh, um, duties and levies that literally kill them. But I'm not going to ask you that today. Let's focus on BDSPs. Uh, Mr. Bamkoli, uh, help us situate uh, you know, this. On the one hand is the need for these BDSPs, as we are discussing. On the other hand is the, is the potential or not or otherwise of some of these investments even seeing the light of day or surviving on a long term. Some of them are just ideas. Some of them may not even be sustainable from the very thought of them. <sighs> Developing them, you know, is, is an issue on its own. What are the things that people need to know in order to take advantage of this? Because there are those who will say the business environment itself is stifling enough to add the extra costs of business development uh, service providers, I can afford it. What would be your take? Okay, thank you very much uh, for uh, welcoming me to this program. You know, we can say the same about every single sector. The cost of healthcare is so expensive we don't have what it takes. Are we not going to go to the hospital or the clinic? Sorry, that's not the way it works. You know, for the same reason, the cost of hotels is very expensive, so I'm not going to stay there if I need to. I think what the BDSPs are, what we are trying to do with BDSPs is to assure the small and medium businesses that if you need to contract them, you know what you are getting into. And so, Monday talked about the quality of services that they deliver. What we did uh, was to look for the best of curriculum to help us to streamline the quality of services that these people would provide. And then they went through a process of accrediting them, uh, which, of course, uh, um, Wahid Olakuju uh, chairs that particular uh, steering committee. Now, that means that if you say, I want to buy a one-star uh, service, you will get a one-star service. If you want a five-star service, you will get a five-star service. 
but at least you know what you are paying for. You know, you can never say, um, you know, uh, knowledge is too expensive, so let me stay with ignorance. That is precisely what this is all about. That for us to be able to take them out of the uh, low level of pressure that they are doing, mm -hmm. we need somebody that is experienced to handhold them and take them to that next level. Okay. And we have seen this in the last few years. We okay. run a program. Yeah, sorry. But, but I just wanted to quickly follow because we don't have so much time, but I want to see how much you can no put in. Oh. Um, most micro businesses, and I'm, I'm yeah. sure Mr. Lagniju, maybe you as well, might be able to give us some figures in that, in that regard. Are there just for people to live by the day? There are those of them who may have a thought about scaling up, but the mere thought of scaling up for them comes to Naira and Kobo. So how do we get them? Because if we don't develop the micro, small, and medium enterprises where you, you, Mr. Lago, you referenced earlier, we are literally lip serving the idea of economic growth if we do not develop micro, small, and medium businesses. So in order to even get people who are literally subsistence business people to the level of sustenance, what do we need to do to get them to get that information across? You know, let, let me give you a very good example that was shared uh, just a few days ago. In Balogun area, there is a young man that was selling um, popcorns, he was selling it in uh, makeshift um, gadgets. And then in less than two, three months, this guy had to open another uh, outlet around CMS. And then in less than another three months, he opened another one in Tunumbu area. Now, this guy started with himself. He was just selling popcorn. But then he knew and he found out that people actually saw it as a very good snack to, to, to run by. It was clean enough for the average person to buy. And as soon as he got that, and he got advice, of course, from maybe some random people, in less than six months, he already had three small outlets. This is precise. And when he had the three, he had to employ people, of course, to demand the other two. Mm -hmm. It is very important for us to understand that the micro people, it is not that they don't have ideas or they don't have they are just waiting for somebody to hold their hand a little okay. and to reassure them about certain things about businesses and that's okay. all okay. meanwhile 99.5 percent of msmes in nigeria today the, the the numbers that we have they are micro okay. so it is important for us to pay attention okay. to those micro. okay mr Lagunjo, how do you all select the SMEs that you work with in BDSPs? BDS, yes, BDSPs. Yeah, there are two approaches. Mm. One, like Peter said, you wait until an entrepreneur approaches you. Okay. To say, I need challenge, I need to apply for a loan in the bank, or we've applied. I, uh, I, didn't, I, I, didn't, I didn't get the loan. Yeah. And okay. also, let's see the quality of application. Then we'll help you prepare a proper application, take you to the bank, if you're able to get the facility, also hold your hand. And all to this make sure that for free? No, I was coming to that. <laughs> I was coming to that. I was coming to that. At the Bank of Industry, when this was embarked upon in 2014, um, the bank incentivized the BDSPs mm -hmm. for the SMEs. The bank paid for the services. On their behalf? Yes, on their behalf. Okay. For, uh, they tied to success, successes, right? If the loan is approved, a certain percentage is paid. If it's disbursed, his side project is also paid to the. So this was negotiated okay. with the with the, with the BDSPs. But of course, for big companies, they are free to negotiate with the BDSPs um, on their own. On the other hand, BDSPs also have advocacy roles, because we cannot just wait until they come to us, because the magnitude of the responsibility at hand. Look at youth unemployment, for example. Mm -hmm. We're well, looking about underemployed and unemployed, maybe about 40 million people. Mm -hmm. To create jobs for them, you need probably to establish one million SMEs every year. Assuming that one million S one SME generates four jobs. So how do you ensure that you create potentially viable and sustainable 
sustainable because you talk of mortality. Yeah. You have to ensure that they don't collapse they after survive. five years, like yeah. you mentioned. Because so if they survive, how, how do you select the SMEs yeah. that so, you, so, you so help we them? So we now go out, for example, I, as a consultant, I go to trade fairs, I go to shopping malls, I go to so many events, and I engage and interact with entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. I talk to them. I go to conferences. Like two weeks ago, we had a conference in Lagos of BDSPs that was facilitated by the Atlantic University, Smedan, and um, other development partners. So many current and potential MSMEs were there, and we discussed with them. So through a program, that's why we are here today as well. We are expecting that through a program like this, those who watch the program, listeners, will be able to approach BDSPs. Okay. They can even approach channels and say, look, how do we is there, get in is touch there, with these BDSPs? Is there a hub? Maybe like a website or some way that people can reach BDSPs? Of course, yes. Like the Smedan website we talked about. Okay. Just Google it. The, 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 the provision is there okay. for you to be able to reach the National Steering Committee on, uh, on uh, BDSPs. So if you have a small business and you're looking for help, here's your chance. Let me ask a slightly funny question, Mr. Lagunji. Have you, uh, you know, encountered anyone where, I mean, you meet this person. This person didn't even know that he had a bankable business. Have you had such encounters? Of course, yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> when you start talking to them, they do, they, 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 that's our response. That's part of business development. Incidentally, before I became EDSMEs, I was also ED business development, right? And uh, there are a lot of schemes we entered into. For example, with the NYSC, we had the Graduate Entrepreneurship Fund, and then we also launched the Youth Entrepreneurship Scheme where we sensitize um, a lot of youth. Like the orientation program in Epaja, I think in 2017, 2016 or so, we got Mrs. Bukwa former chairman of First Bank, to come and address them as an entrepreneur. She now told them how she used to work in a furniture company and how mm. she drew inspiration, mm. how she started producing chairs from her father's garage until late and for Ladi Olanku discovered her and they mentored her and they supported her. So such people, role models, we use them to engage. To tell stories of success. Success stories. We have just about three minutes to end this conversation, but uh, let me ask uh, Mr. Ewans. Now, for those who, know, who are not even aware, who have been doing, trying to do a small business or the other um, over the years and they don't know, what, what for you is the success rate of the development of micro, small, and medium businesses in Nigeria, at least from Smidan Angle. And how, in your opinion, will this um, initiative of BDSPs help to change the figures? If you can do that in 30 seconds. Yeah, thank you so much. Of course, um, the, uh, the last survey we did with MBS, we had about 39.6 uh, million MSMEs, and uh, they contributed about 46.31% 40, to GDP. And of course, to grow these numbers is something that must be done. And of course, we, the platform we are having right now is to make sure that uh, BDSPs and uh, MSMEs come together so that we can grow these numbers. It's only the, 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 the time we grow these numbers that we can have effective uh, contribution to GDP in Nigeria, to exports, and so on and so forth. And of course, Smedan is doing a lot of things to support small businesses in Nigeria. We are doing what we call one local government, one product program. We are doing conditional grant scheme for micro enterprises. We are also doing what we call the National Business Skill Development Initiative, another program to support small businesses, to grow them, to, to scale their businesses, to make sure that we have an effective uh, contribution to GDP and other parameters in this country. Okay. You Thank owe you me so 30 much. seconds. Um, when I see you in Abuja, I'm going to collect it. But Mr. Bankoli, let me ask you um, one question that I didn't want to ask, but I'm just going to have to ask it because uh, it's one of those things that you would agree um, stifle these small businesses, and that is these duties and levies. There are so those of them who complain, and they literally groan under it. How, do these BD, how does this BDSP initiative help to change that paradigm? Okay, um, thank you very much. You are absolutely correct. Um, the levies and, and, and taxes and all kinds, we counted them. It was almost like 39 in some states. But the reality is that there are waivers on different things, and the BDSPs usually will be aware. For instance, this year, uh, depending on 
how much you are making as, as a, a small business, you may not even be liable to pay in tax for this year. That has already been legislated. There are many little, little things that the MSMEs may not be aware of, but the BDSPs will be aware of because of the uh, professional work they are doing. So that's okay. why sometimes maybe you pay a little to actually gain a lot more. Okay. Well, uh, Mr. Lagunju, um, so where do we go from here? Uh, what are the what are the prospects for you within the next one year, two years for SMEs? We are going to be proactive. We'll be mining, for instance, the data available in the telecom space. Most of us use these phones just to talk, but there's a lot of things we can do. The need of digitalization to promote and organize MSMEs in Nigeria. At the last count, we're looking at 154 million subscribers to the data of the telcos in Nigeria, maybe about 200 million phone lines. We can pass a lot of messages through them. That's what we plan to do next phase on a proactive basis. These phone business models, that means they have some purchasing power. It's pay as you go. We need to do an analysis of the demography. How many of them are women, how many of them are youth? What do they do? That suggests some financial inclusion. That suggests some business inclusion. We need to organize them better, perhaps the cooperatives, to strengthen them. Because according to PwC, 65% of the Nigerian economy is in the formal sector. Absolutely. We need to bring them on board. If we bring them on board, that will also increase, for example, the taxable net. I was Those hoping you would not say that. Mr. No, no, but, but that, <laughs> no, 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 but, but that, it is the reality. Okay, yes, that, but that, I was that just is, hoping. That is, that is the reality <laughs> yeah. because the, the, the Nigerian economy is grossly underestimated. Absolutely. Because a lot of things are happening that are not recorded, that are not captured. Yeah. But if we integrate them, that will also mean they will contribute to the micro pension scheme. That will also mean they will subscribe to insurance products. And we're looking forward to the insurance sector and the pension sector to generate long-term funds mm. required to finance, for example, the National Development Plan. You see, the, that tax and part, I don't think the MSME has to hear it. No, why no, 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 no. <laughs> they, they, uh, not not, well, not complex no, tax, right. but pay as you earn. You are, you as are correct. You are yeah, correct, yeah. but... Nobody wants to hear taxes. <laughs> yeah. But if the services are rendered, people are willing to pay. Thank you very pay. much for being a part of our conversation this morning. Wahid yeah. Alagunju is uh, a former acting MD CEO of Bank of Industry and Chairman National Steering Committee on Business Development Service Providers, BDSPs. Thanks for joining us Thank you for this morning. Mm -hmm. Monday Ewans is Director, Enterprise Development and Promotion at Smedan. <laughs> He joined us from Abuja. Thank you so much for your time, as well as Peter Bamkole, who is Director, yep. Enterprise so Development Center, Pan Atlantic University. He joins us virtually from Lagos. Gentlemen, thank, thank you. Thank you. thank you so much for your time this morning. Uh, something is happening on Monday, and uh, we want to talk about it now. Because by next Saturday, it will be like, uh, how many days after that? Too many days. After the fact. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where we began with the mother tongue and vernacular thing. We'll be right back. Take me to the days when we used to live in joy and peace. I wanna go back to the day. Thank you for staying with us. Now, you know, at the beginning of this program, we were talking about mother tongue and vernacular. I've, I still wonder why it's called mother tongue. What happened to the fathers? You're not single parents. Well, I did say there was father tongue as well, didn't I? You said vernacular is father tongue. <laughs> 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 what do you mean by that? <laughs> anyway, anyway, anyway. There is, UNESCO has designated an international mother tongue day. And I find that very exciting, especially in today's Nigeria, where many of our children think that the sign of being mm, tush is not being able to speak your mother tongue. I'm still protesting that we mother part. We speak the Queen's English. Oh, dear. <laughs> I'm yes, still, you, I'm you still, heard somebody's voice in I'm the still background. Protesting. <laughs> I'm still protesting. I'm still protesting. I'm still protesting. Why mother? Okay. Why not father? What did fathers do? Father tongue. So father tongue. Ugh. Here we go again. <laughs> I'm outnumbered. There you go. 
Let's not even go there. Uh, so according to the United Nations Educational, mm. Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, 40% mm. of the population globally does not have access to an education in a language they speak, mm. like us. Mm -hmm. I speak Shekiri, mm -hmm. he speaks Yoruba. Mm -hmm. We were taught in English, of course. <laughs> but UNESCO has a point. Mm -hmm. So this is the reason that the UNESCO has set aside the 21st day of February every year to raise awareness on the importance of learning in your mother tongue. Mm. And the theme for this year is using technology for multilingual learning challenges and opportunities. I'm wondering how you learn Pythagoras theorem in the Shakiri. You, yeah, you were saying something. <laughs> Just go ahead. Go Pythagoras ahead. theorem was learned in Chinese. So what is in Mandarin? What Just is your a problem? question. Introduce your guests. We have two <laughs> guests in the studio. It's my pleasure to welcome an educationist, Antoinette Omo Osage. Good morning. Good morning. Somebody apparently that I knew in my other life. <laughs> and <laughs> Theodora Isama Group Bankoli, a practical impact uh, of Practical Impact Network. Thank you. Thank you very much yeah, for good coming. Good morning. Yeah. Or not? Yes. So you have been in this business forever. <laughs> Seems that way. <laughs> we were taught in English. Mm -hmm. What are you trying to tell us today with this International Mother Tongue Day? Uh, what uh, the late Professor Fafungwa had been saying for a thousand years that we need to teach our children in the language closest to them. In this case, we always talk, we use the language of the locality. In other words, if a child is living in Mushi, the language of the locality there is Yoruba. So that child would automatically be made to learn the language of that area alongside his own mother tongue. Because at the end of the day, what uh, was planned for Nigeria way, way back when was that every Nigerian child will at least learn two Nigerian languages. One which we call the N1, which would have been the child's mother tongue, mm -hmm. and then the N2, which in most likely would be the language of the locality where that child is. And this was in the policy on education as far back as um, the 1980s, 90s. It was in the curriculum. So still there. <laughs> Therein lies the tragedy. Unfortunately, uh, whoever, whoever came up with a great idea to tamper with the Nigerian curriculum removed the Nigerian languages, and then it was further dealt a blow by the examination bodies who decided that the children did not have to take a Nigerian mm -hmm. language any longer. Okay. You know, in the past, you had to do one Nigerian language as part of your core mm. uh, exam okay. subjects. But now mm. they don't have to do that anymore. And in having done all of this, they literally removed the last vestige of the entire work of late people like late Babsua Fungwa, mm -hmm. late um, uh, Professor Juliet Macaulay, people who had worked seriously to see that this country we raised, uh, for oh, the past 25 years I, I ran a school, we've always celebrated the, you know, um, the Nigerian language day, I mean the language, the international language, mother language day, because I've always been very, very clear that my students must speak a Nigerian, a Nigerian language. language. And I couldn't afford, I, I would have been more than happy to provide up to nine Nigerian language teachers, but of course I can't afford to do that. <laughs> so I had at least two. So you either taught, we either taught them Yoruba, which would then be the language of the locality where the school was located, mm -hmm. and then we had Igbo because it was easy to get an Igbo teacher, and so I had Igbo as well. And I must say that over the years, at least the first generation of children I had, they all learned you know, these two languages simultaneously. And it worked. In fact, we created language zones in that school in those days. If you walked through a particular section of the school, you were made to speak the language of that zone. So if you walk through the Igbo zone, you better be sure that maybe the Igbo teacher is looking around there and will expect you to talk to her in Igbo. And say Kiki, man. Exactly. <laughs> and then you moved further down, it would be Yoruba zone. And then we also added French in those days. And, and it worked for us because we had a lot of our students mm. who left school, 
excited and happy that they could speak and write Whoa. these languages. Unfortunately, Whoa. the problem now is not even with the education sector anymore. The problem, we'll deal with the education sector, but we have to deal with the parents first. Yes. I agree. Theodora, yeah. using technology for multilingual learning, okay? We haven't even learned the language yet. <laughs> okay. We want to use the language to teach technology. Okay. How are we going to do that? All right. First of all, I remember when uh, Professor Fafua, Mabantu de Fafua said, let's teach the children in the language of the locality. People ask. I remember that. How are you going to say Tozo um, photos, whatever photosynthesis, photosynthesis, photosynthesis in Yoruba? And I have an answer for that. I have a comeback. My comeback is, your name is Alero. I'm speaking Yoruba to you. I don't have to translate Alero to Yoruba Thank before you. I call you Alero. You can still call it photosynthesis I can in still, Igbo. Yes, yeah, exactly. I can still That's call it, it photosynthesis and speak Igbo. You know it's photosynthesis. So now... Um, Pythagoras, are you listening? <laughs> uh, he died a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> are you listening? <laughs> so now... Bringing technology into it does not mean, okay, we are talking about somehow it's becoming a bilingualism thing or multilingualism thing. So somehow, okay, for this thing not to just kill our languages like that, the African languages, okay, let's just key into it a bit. That's where technology comes in. If you want to use the French system of academy, you know, from time to time, the French government is okay. New things have come. Let's uh, give them new names. They're going to connote them like about 100 things, about 1,000 things. They're going to sit down. So, okay, now we give this one name. This person calls it computer. We're going to give it ha. This person calls this one laptop. We're going to give it who. So if I'm going to use that system to say, okay, now with technology, this name is what we're going to give to this in my language. Of course, there is no word like computer in my language. There's no translation. So we are going to have something like that as, okay, this is an academy. We are trying to give names, new names to the things that just came in our language. We can use that with a new technology. But we can as well say, okay, I'm using my language to teach, to you know, bring technology to come to life. Yet I see pick a bit of those words. Mm -hmm. Those are weldings. Yes. So we can as see. to remain globally relevant. Yeah, globally relevant. So, I know, I know that in some Nigerian languages, um, because something does not exist in our culture, when we translate from English, for instance, we describe what that yes, yes, that's what like we do. Like in my language, a fork is ugonjeje, okay. that with which you. So I pick your food, food yes. Yes. Put it in your mouth. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so now so it, that is a fork. So the syllables become too many yes, but for an outsider to grab easily, right? That is the reason for this academy. If we can imbibe it, we sit down. We just connote all the things that have been new, the new things that have come in the past five, ten years. We bring them together and we ask, okay, this is going to be the new name. So this time around, it's not as if somebody will just stand up and say, okay, Kwajeje will come back in my place too. Kwajeje, I'm an Urubu woman. Kwajeje. So it won't be something like that. We agree. Kwajeje. Kwajeje. Yeah. So we just, okay, let's get something with a few syllables. Maybe one, maybe two. So that it will be easy to grab. That's what, that's the French pattern, actually. Well, yes. Uh, so I, I don't know if one says. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think in, in, in creating uh, the wordings we need in education, the thing what people need to do is to recognize the fact that, yes, we're not going to be able to translate everything mm -hmm. into, quote, the known languages, but we're going to say it in words that explains it to us ourselves. For example, mm -hmm. I, you know, the Yoruba language, the Yoruba don't have a word that talks about uh, internet, but they will talk about er, ero alujara. In other words, Network. this machine that covers Connect the whole everyone. world, connects the whole world. Please, and everybody, please say that again. Ero, alujara, alujara. You know, in other words, the, 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 uh, the machine that connects the whole world. And everybody understands that. So, you know, the, yes, there is, there is a... Ero, asoro, magbisi. That's your... You know, the radio. Radio. 
It's the radio. Ah. Yeah, the, the radio. <laughs> <laughs> it's not phoning. Yeah, with the time you can phone in and you're not this. That's true. <laughs> but you see, the, the, the issue for me is we're jumping. The, if we follow uh, the UNESCO's challenges and technology and all of that, mm. we're going to miss our own point. And our point right now is our parents need to be re educated. Because they have grown up in a system where they used to say well, they would punish you if you speak vernacular. Mm. And our languages were the vernacular. Mm. Now we have to get back to the point where the vernacular now is the English language, which I don't want them. Because a lot of times, a lot of our children, they speak English. And I'm really, I'm surprised, I'm shocked. The level of English spoken by our children in this country at the moment is atrocious. Is. They're not speaking properly. I mean, we grew up in a season where we were raised, trained by mostly probably foreigners, and we learned to speak the English language properly. Today, they're not speaking the English language properly. They're they are not spelling the properly. Vernacular properly. Exactly. And then they can't speak their own languages. So now we've got a society of children who can think in English. They can think, think in their culture. What exactly are they thinking in now is a question. <laughs> Okay, so, now, this, this issue, I just, when you started speaking, I just googled the word vernacular. Mm -hmm. Now, the language or dialect spoken by the ordinary people okay. in a particular country or region, mm -hmm. the adjective of language spoken as one's mother tongue, not learned or imposed as a second language. Okay. So, so we are the ones that are speaking... The one that is vernacular. Okay. So let us have this conversation in vernacular. It's only that if I start speaking in Yoruba and you start speaking your own language, it's gonna be cacophony here. <laughs> <coughs> but in, in solving the problem, you 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 are about us even re education re education re parents. parents, yes. Now, where did that ideology start from? Of people saying if you speak uh, in your mother tongue, you are speaking in vernacular, you mm -hmm. have to speak in the English language. Where did it come from and how much of a problem is it today? It came from our educational system under the British okay. colonial government, you know, the colonial administration. And the reason was they needed the Africans, and I'm going to use the African word, the Africans to be able to speak the Queen's English so that they can relate with the mother office, the crown. The crown. And so we, we, they needed that. So everybody was being taught that. If you wanted to go beyond uh, just being a, a, a typist, you should be able to speak good Queen's English in order to get a good job in an office or even go abroad. So that became a part of what we are. <clears throat> All these people were coming into the schools. Remember the idea of you put your hand in your ear before you can go to school? So they were much older when they came in, and it was a race to try to clean them up enough mm. to be able to face the crown. Mm. Now, once that became entrenched, it continued, because then the English was a very big deal. If you didn't pass your English, you didn't do well in English, you couldn't carry yourself in English, you were not going to go very far. And you are not educated. You are not educated, yeah. exactly. So yeah. that became a part of who we are. And like I constantly say, it appears that in our collective minds in this country, we do have an inferiority complex. Of course. That keeps us marooned in a mindset that says, if I am not doing certain things the way they want me to do it, then I'm not good enough. Are you by any chance calling for a constitutional review? Because I you know that that's I, the language... Well, you see, that's also that's a, the official that language. is a problem as well. Because, for example, I remember years back, I had the uh, opportunity to take some of my students to the Ogun State House of Assembly on a day in which the Ogun State House of Assembly conducts business in the mother tongue, in Yoruba language. Wow. I was fascinated oh, by that. Oh, they that in Lagos. Yes, wow. I was fascinated Fantastic. by that. And so I took my students there. And, of course, I had to take along my Yoruba teachers because I knew most of the children were going to be... But we had already groomed them to be able to say certain things, you know, do all of that. But it was to them, they were fascinated. They said, am I saying that all these things are written in Yoruba? I said, well, if they are speaking Yoruba all throughout today, whoever is recording would have to record in Yoruba. Mm -hmm. And then they can go and translate it into English. The children found it very fascinating. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. they asked me if they did the same in the, you know, uh, federal house. And I'm like, well, I don't... That would be difficult. <laughs> that would be difficult. Because it's the federal house... Mm -hmm. 
from all over the country. All over the country, and there'll be too many languages okay. to deal with. Yes. Mm. Uh, they, this is uh, just a, a beginning of a conversation. We can't really go far with it. Okay. Uh, but, madam, um, conducting uh, legislative business in Yoruba language, okay. that's one way to look at it. There are those who are saying, who are asking the question, wait a minute, in the north, they mm. teach classes, um, professor is just telling me that they just teach classes in Hausa language. Oh, yeah. um, so yeah. they, does that mean that they also teach English language in Hausa language? Mm -hmm. And that's what happens? Mm -hmm. Actually, the teacher, when he, okay, usually when a French teacher comes to your school, here or now or then, he's just going to speak French yep. because this is French section. So, so when he wants to teach English, he's going to teach English with English. But if he sees that the student is not getting it clearly, he's going to delve into Hausa a little. Mm. To explain. Yeah, to explain. Mm. And actually, they grab it more. Those of us from the past, no, 40s and above. By the way, have you ever seen any Hausa child who cannot speak Hausa? No. I it haven't How is that going to happen? Any, they don't exist. They, I haven't, I haven't any, seen any. Although I've seen one in worry that couldn't speak fluently, but, but could I still understand. Could understand and could speak a bit of it. Mm. But in my place, for instance, in Delta State, in Ugeli, you see a child that doesn't know anything beyond Migo. That's all. Just say, where is your mother? Anywhere up? He doesn't understand. And the next slang is, oh, Robo help. Or, oh, Robo is too hard. Can you imagine that is supposed to have that language that is supposed to promote the language you're saying it is hard because you heard it from your mother it, it now raises the question she asked okay. the other time about re-educating parents okay um, do you see that necessary how do we begin that conversation that's what we do in practical impact network that's what we do we promote you know, the mother tongue in the home front is the is that understanding if has it even percolated to the parents themselves to see how important it is for them to raise those kids in their mother tongue drive that confidence the interest into them first if you drive the interest in that's what we're trying to do we drive the interest in i will tell them that if you believe if you believe in someone else's language you have lost your confidence mm. if you're already complex now am, am i misguided because I begin to see that many parents now see the importance of teaching their children the mother tongue. Or am I misled? Or? No, <laughs> they just mourn. They just mourn. Hey, what do we do? Ah, it are not. But they don't do anything about it. Actually. Because sometimes mm. they take their children out mm. and they want to say something to mm. them that they don't want anybody else mm. to. to and then they regret not having taught the children <laughs> and they do their eyes and, and the children say, Mommy, something wrong with your eyes. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then it ends there. No, but you know, when she goes home, she's still going to continue with English. It, it, because she, it's, it's a bit of a problem. When you say, okay, sit there in your language, and the child does not understand, before you know it, you have gone back. So I always tell because parents... Because you are frustrated. Yeah, you're frustrated. So I always tell parents, continue until you become comfortable with it. First of all, we are not even comfortable in this Well, language. at least let's make sure that they, even if they can't speak it, mm -hmm. let's make sure that they understand. Well, they, they, they need to, no, they need to even they be able to... Understand. They need if to even be able to recognize it first. You wanted to say something no, I, I was just thinking of a story my medical doctor told me. Which I was talking about this mother language issue with her once, and she said... She was actually cut short when she took, she traveled to South Africa with her children, about five of them, and they were in line trying to pick something and the daughter was talking to her and she started talking to the daughter in English. And the girl at the teal said to her, why are you doing that? Okay. And she was like, what did I do? Why are you talking to your language, your daughter in English? You can't speak to her in your language. We'll never do that in South Africa. Every child in South Africa must speak first and foremost Zulu. Or whatever well, there is a said. problem there as well because when I, I studied French mm -hmm. and three of us from University of Badon went to the same university mm -hmm. in France in mm -hmm. Nice, mm -hmm. I am Shakiri. Mm -hmm. The other girl was Igbo from Asaba. Mm -hmm. The third girl was Yoruba, mm -hmm. and we constantly were asked the question, "Why do you three communicate in, in English?" English. <laughs> and we had to explain all the time that mm -hmm. there is no Nigerian language. language. There are three of us, mm -hmm. and we both speak three different languages, so okay. we cannot speak and understand yeah, each other. Yeah, but you see, that, that, that is not a problem. That shouldn't be a problem. You should be able to celebrate it 
in that case. I mean, I, when I schooled in the U.S., I always had that question asked, you Nigerians are not together. And I'm like, it's because we're not together in our languages that we are all united at the end of the day. Because I would happily say I'm a do, but you do not ask me that question as a first question. Yes. Because your first question to me should be not, where are you from in yeah. Nigeria? Yeah. It should be, where, where are you? Who are you? Right. I'm a Nigerian. Nigerian. And that should stop it. Because they don't do that for other Africans. It's only Nigerians who do, they do it too. And they should appreciate the fact that, look, I'm a Nigerian from a very diverse background. Yes. So if you talk to me in any of my Nigerian language, I may not be able to tell, but I'll recognize that that's a Nigerian language. Yeah. But mm. that's not the one I speak. Mm. So I'm a person of very rich cultural Culture. background. Mm. And Baba. so I make a big deal out of that. Baba. That's the, <laughs> the, the, the other thing is that, Nigerians need to appreciate the fact that we have a very diverse culture. People say to me now, but you see, it's not my fault. My husband is Yoruba and I'm Igbo. And oh. so that the child is blessed because yes. the child has an opportunity to learn. To learn, the learn. I used to tell to my t staff who are married, I have a, a, a staff who is a Doma and the wife is Yoruba. And, I, and of course, they live in Shagam, right? So they must, the child, the language of the locality is Yoruba. And then I say to the children, your children don't speak Idoma. And the man looked at me and I said, you, yeah, I said, I expect them to speak Idoma. And I made a big deal out of it. And do you know that now those little girls, they're growing up on that premises. They speak Yoruba fluently. They are learning to speak Idoma. Because yeah, as I said, it's very simple. Children, they can be like the Tower of Babel. That's a beautiful thing about language. Mm. If a child is in an environment where you're speaking in Shekiri, he's speaking Yoruba, she's speaking Rubu, I'm speaking Edo, that child will pick it all, all up. Yeah. The child will figure it out eventually and be able to figure yes, out which indeed. one is which. Yeah. But when we don't let them do it at all, mm, that's, that's where the parents yes. are at fault. You talked about Nigeria. Yeah, no, you oh, talked about We're parents. running out of time. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, she talked about... Because the, the, you, we're talking about the international mother tongue there. The mm -hmm. mother is a parent. Okay. Now, so in you, you talked about the inferiority complex of parents. Yes. Do we have... How do we, how do we begin to redress that? Uh, we reparent. We have to reparent our parents. So parents yes, need to be parented. Parent. Yes, yes, parents yes. need to be parented. That's You're what listening. I do. You need to be a pa they need need to be be parent. Reparented. You're a child. <laughs> okay. Okay, Adora. <laughs> yeah. The 20th of uh, February. 21st, 21st of February. February. Yes. yes. What's going to happen on that day? Okay, hmm. on that day for PIN Africa, we are going at POP, mm -hmm. Public Opinion Poll. We want to find out those that can speak their languages, those from an intertribal home that can speak up to two languages. Actually, we can speak children. And every child can speak up to five different languages at the age of two. Mm -hmm. For as long as the child can talk at the same time, don't just get that child confused. Don't speak two at the same time. Because if you speak two at the same time, the child is going to get confused and is going to pick the same place. And today, English is the same place. So we are going to go out there Ask them, where is your mother from? Where is your father from? We are from two different places. My mother is Yoruba, my father is Idoma, and I can speak the two. So we are just going to go around. That's what we're going to do. But in Paris, we are going to celebrate culture all over the world. You know, Paris is the headquarter of uh, UNESCO. It started from there in 1999. Okay, they agreed during that conference in 1999, 2000, it started February 20, 20, uh, February 21st because of the killing of seven students that were killed, that were killed, yes, at Dakar, Dakar in Bangladesh because they were, you know, there was a movement for language. They were trying to impose or do a Pakistan language on them. And these people said, we want a Bangladesh. Youth, they were killed. Seven of them and about 300 were injured. People still insist today that those that were killed were more than seven. So because of that, 1952, they started marking it, marking it until 1999 that UNESCO agreed that, okay, let's commemorate these big children. So 2002, February 21st, it started. So that's what they are doing, celebrating languages all over the world, celebrating culture, diversity. But any, any celebration in Nigeria? Okay, Nigeria well, does not observe that yet. No, they okay. do, they do, sorry. Okay. Sorry. Uh, a few years ago, I think uh, the Federal Ministry of Education now pronounced the 21st of February as a 
a day well, to be say, yeah. they call it cultural day, you okay, know, okay. how we tend to turn things around. Right. The emphasis is no longer on, on the language, language alone. it's now on culture, culture and all that. Well, that's fine, it's a good place, it's a, it's a jumping it's a off start. place, okay. it's a start. It's but that was just a few years ago. Okay, but they are really not celebrating it, it's just pronounced. Okay. Yeah, it's just pronounced. Yeah, but we have learned something this morning. Okay. Um, parents have to be reparented. <laughs> yes, reparented. <laughs> Especially. And, uh, and let me just say more than that. <laughs> and they should know that. And it is a good thing for our children to actually speak our language. Do we want to live in a world where our language or our languages mm. are dying? Our culture disappears. That's because what our happen. children cannot speak mm. or understand yes. our language. Thank you very much for yeah, coming. Very this welcome. Morning. I would just like to say this: that Quickly. my son speaks Urobo and Yoruba. In fact, my husband is Yoruba. I'm Bankole. My husband is Yoruba, and I'm Urobo. And the child is was raised here. You see here, he speaks Urobo and he speaks Yoruba. So if it can happen for me, it can happen too with you. So. Good luck yeah. while you try to teach your children your native tongue and happy it can International be. Mother Tongue Day. Day. Thank you very much, Antoinette Amosagi, educationist, and Theodora Esama Gubankoli, yeah. Practical Impact Network. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Yeah, We're coming to have this very interesting conversation with us this morning. Yeah. And important. Thank you. Sunrise will be right back with the... With the whole stretch before which we are going to go to Oshun very quickly. Okay. You're probably su suspecting is that the artist of the week? We'll get into that in a bit, but let's first of all very quickly take you to Oshun State, where we shift our focus on the Oshun State APC governorship primaries, which is underway right now. Of course, the, uh, the exercise is holding in 323 wards in the state, and of course the party has approved direct primary for the exercise and three contestants are participating. The incumbent governor, uh, Buega Oyetola, is seeking another four-year term, looking for a second term. Also in the race is former secretary to the state government, Mashud Adeuti, as well as former deputy speaker, House of Representatives, Lasso Yusuf. So let's uh, get to our correspondent, uh, Babajide Agbeo, who is to bring us up to speed on how far so far Good morning, Babajide. How far so far? Good morning. Yes, go ahead. I can hear you. Well, um, the, the, no, the noise here is quite much. The enthusiasm, the enthusiasm of party members and all that. But if you can just permit me to just go ahead. This is Ward 5, Aleku Wodo in Oshobo, the Ocean State capital. And uh, you can see the large number of voters, party members, so to say. They are ecstatic, they are enthusiastic. They have done their accreditation, and I think they are just waiting for the voting to begin. Definitely, you would confirm that they belong to different camps. So they belong to different camps, as you can see, and uh, they are chanting different uh, songs. But more importantly, uh, we've gone around to look at the security situation. Uh, we got to the party secretariat earlier this morning, and uh, one would see from there that the portion leading to that secretariat has been, you know, cordoned off to forestall any unforeseen circumstance. And uh, apart from this, while we were coming from Malaysia, we have been to Irepodun local government and some other locations, and we will see not too heavy presence, but at least reasonable large number of police officers, you know, were there to ensure that nobody behaves funny. Accreditation has been done at all the locations uh, we've been to. Some are still having it in progress and some have exhausted the process as we can, you know, uh, see here. 
and I've not noticed any uh, flash or trace of violence as of now. But we keep watching as events unfold from this end. Well, most certainly, Babajide, I doubt if you can hear a thing that I'm going to say right now because of the noise in the background, but we definitely will keep up with you to ensure that you bring us blow-by-blow blow account as things unfold. Thank you so much, Babajide Agbeo, our correspondent in Osho State. Oshobo uh, is where he is, and the, uh, the primary is holding in 300, more than 300 wards in the state as at this moment. So, who is our artist of the week? Why are you looking at me like that? Peter the Rock. Yeah. You know, for a second, when I saw him earlier, I thought it was Victor Waifo. Good morning. Well, he's Victor Waifo's nephew. Oh. <laughs> yeah, correct. <laughs> he's Victor Waifo, and he's kind of sporting a guitar as well. And, and Good oh, to see you, Peter. Thank you. Mm. Pleasure. I mean, are you trying to be another Pete, um, Victor Waifo? Uh, I would say... <laughs> 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 okay. Let me say, I am already. Oh. I'm not trying. <laughs> okay. All right. Mm. Is your music in any way similar to his? Um, yes, of course. Yes, of course. Okay. Well, um, Peter the Rock, uh, Peter Waifo, obviously, is a songwriter and a musician and is multi-talented and he's the nephew of the legend Peter Waifo. Mm. Um, Peter is the son of the brother of Victor and he lost his father when he, the father unfortunately didn't live too long and uh, when he passed uh, Peter was adopted by Victor. And picked up the guitar as well. So it is no wonder that he picked up the guitar and he's almost a spitting image of I'm telling you. Victor Waifo. Yeah. In fact, my partner here thought that he was Victor Waifo. Sincerely. You know, he must have thought, my God, we've been visited by a ghost. <laughs> no, that is sincerely, because I said, wait a minute, uh, um, what's happening here? I mean, who, this fella? I mean, I was seeing the singer, I mean, it's a good one, you Thank know. You. Was it deliberate on your part to uh, want to look like uh, Victor Waifo? Uh, not really, but I don't just know how it happens. I don't know how it happened, but by just in myself, just uh, uh, being a replica already, you know. Uh, maybe because I took interest in music, because my father was the original Waifo himself. Uh, although it was yeah, not... Your father was also a musician. Yeah, he talked Sir uh, Victor Waifu music. Oh. oh, really? Yeah, before uh, Sir Victor Waifu took it to the next level. I so in, everywhere in Edo, the Edo people would tell you that Sir Victor Waifu, Edo brother, brought him up mm. in music. So, mm. But I never saw my father doing music. Uh, I never saw my father doing music. It was but, Peter you saw. Yeah, it was Peter I saw right from, <laughs> you know. So that's how we are here doing the music as well. And so I'm happy being part of music and also taking the legacy of Sir Victor Waifu to the next level. What, have, what, what, what kind of uh, feedback have you gotten since you started in this trajectory? Okay. Uh, uh, have you had many people make the same mistake I have made? <laughs> For almost calling you yes, Victor Yes, Waifu, yes, of course. It. You know, the, anybody that sees me performing of playing, the, the top that, that, that run through their mind or what the feedback I hear is that Victor Waifu lives on. Oh. That's just okay. the simple word to use. Let's there not was... waste any more time. <laughs> <laughs> Give us some vibes. Let's, okay. let's, uh, let's, let's hear let's feel the wife. Okay, uh, before I, I... I'm going to do two songs of Sabi to Waifu now. Okay. Uh, I will do... Um, I'll play a song titled Ovie in Bini language. Oba ga tok be e. He said... Ovie me lota ore o ne pega be
here, Peter. Just hold on on that second <laughs> one first. Let's, 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 let's talk to you. Okay. So, um, after school, you started to learn to play the guitar with yeah. your uncle. Yeah. Um, was it because your uncle played the guitar that you also picked up the guitar? Um, I would say um, yes. I would say yes because he was source of my inspiration because I grew up to meet him and I grew up to love him and I always said to myself, I want to be like him. You know, although before I started learning the music uh, instrument, I was already an artist. Ah, what were you doing? I was just singing, you know, <laughs> the difference between an artist and a being singer. a musician. <laughs> okay. You know, an artist is someone that creates music and heart to the creation of music. But a musician is someone that plays the musical instrument, compose, arrange, and, you know, perform. Hmm. So... This is the two difference. So I was already an artist. Now I'm not a musician. Okay. So wait, Oga. Um, you know you are, you have a very big shoe to fill, right? Yeah. What size of shoe was you wearing? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, this is why I'm asking. Because there are those who will see you and say, "Okay, you look like Victor Wife for the Victor Wife for we knew." Yeah. And they will want you to perform some of his songs. Yeah. Has that happened? Yes. Okay. So uh, can you perform Guitar Boy? Okay, yes, but I normally like it when I'm when, uh, have a when, I, yes, when I'm on stage. Uh, because well, you're on stage, only that you can't stand. Yeah, I can't stand. <laughs> I can't go. You know, Guitar Boy is a very, is one of very the energetic. critical. Uh, yes, yes uh, very, very energetic. Yeah, so it's not, you don't just play it. Okay. So you, you see, won't be prepared. My, my producer and director want you to stand, but I'm afraid for the cable of my mic. Yes, yeah. the microphone. So um, well, you're going to stand carefully. And you're going to perform it. Uh, but before you do that, we'll close on that one. Okay. Uh, so okay, so uh, we, will we will close with uh, We'll close with, with, guitar, with boy. guitar Boy. Okay. But, um, in, in moving forward, what are some of the challenges you see for yourself? And what are the steps you are taking to overcome? Uh, okay. Uh, you know, some of the challenges I, I have seen so far... It's both especially uh, people, they see me as a big guy. Someone that is already, you know, that is big because of um, uh, the name Waifu. I told you you had a problem. <laughs> <laughs> I told you you had a yeah, big so, shooting you. So they normally say, okay, maybe... Prevention, you don't want to help me because you see, you, you know I'm already big. Uh, that's why. After you, all, you are a wife. Yeah, after all, I'm a wife. Mm. So I, you, you would think I don't need any assistant. Yes. I don't need any help. You I don't need a lot of money. Yeah, I don't need money. Uh, the, the little guy needs all this thing to oh, keep on to survive. So that's <laughs> one of the major facts. And yeah, so that's it. That's it. So, in, in moving forward now, what's the vision for Peter the Rock? What, what? The vision, vision. for Peter the okay. Rock. Okay. Uh, one, one of my vision, you know, is, uh, I, I say, I promise my dope people, I promise Nigerians that I will keep the legacy, the musical legacy. You know, so Professor Peter Eiffel is broad and wide. Mm -hmm. So, I will do everything possible to keep the legacy and to make Nigeria proud. Hmm. Okay. Well, we, we have to, so that we can listen to some of this music that you want to give us, we have to close this segment now. Um, Alora, I can see that you are mesmerized. You remember Victor Waifo. Uh, you know, one of, I know, you know, he was just that guy, you know what I'm saying? Stop looking at me like that. <laughs> <laughs> have you quite good <laughs> Victor Waifu lives on in Peter the Rock, Peter Isoke, Waifu. Rest in peace, Victor Waifu. Mm. Yeah. And that is where we draw the curtain on today's show. Well, we're, we're just going to close and hand it over to...
Peter to do his thing, whether it's his, oh no, we've chosen guitar, guitar boy. Guitar boy. Whether you, you can perform the acoustic version so that it does, it's not as energetic, but we want to hear it. Uh, okay. Okay. So see you next week with a fresh version or fresh edition of Sunrise. I am Alero Edu, wishing you a happy weekend and a blessed week ahead. And I'm Ayo Makede. Have a wonderful, wonderful rest of the day.